present, Sean Hoyt, and I am present as well. And I'm going to hand it over to. I just want to mention yes. one thing. Not to hand it over to no, uh, There are agendas on the table there, as well as two sets of presentations. The first one are the district curriculum and student services slides. Those were in your packet from last time's meeting. But for those in the audience who were not here, there's a set of those. And then the second are the elementary school presentations, including the early steps preschool, which nobody All right. I'm going to hand it out. The third item on the agenda is reports. Uh, FY19 superintendent's recommended budget. The first item is district curriculum. I'm going to hand it over to superintendent. Thank you very much. So we are very excited to be here for our second night um, to present to you the recommended budget from um, the school department for fiscal year 19. Uh, we made great progress uh, the last time that we met and um, tonight we are going to pick, pick back up with district curriculum um, and student services and then uh, as time allows we will start to work through elementary. Um, but we will assess as we go. Um, but we have some very exciting presentations for you tonight. I'm going to say, as I said the other night, uh, that the process I think there's more people here who might want to hear a little bit about the process, but um, the process that we used to get to the point of pr presenting this budget um, was very collaborative in nature. We worked with um, the admin council and the larger district leadership team uh, to try to look at our, our priorities and in, in frame it really in student learning and student outcomes and trying to make sure that whatever it is that we present to you this evening is tied directly to that, that mission of our school system, which is to ensure that all students learn. Um, so I think as we go along, you'll hear, especially tonight, uh, many of the things that we're working on are really framed in, in with that perspective and looking at evidence-based practice, um, looking at ways that we can maximize um, growth, not just for our students, but for our educators. That will come through, I think, a lot in what we talk about tonight. Um, so I'm not going to take up too much time more, but I would like to hand it over to Dr. Teresa McGinnis, who is our Assistant Superintendent for Teaching, Learning, and Assessment, uh, who will provide an overview of the district's curriculum. Great. Thank you. And welcome everyone. As many of you who might have been here last week um, might recall, my colleagues um, framed our work with uh, technology that we use for infrastructure in the district, buildings, um, uh, all of the land, everything that we need to make the students' um, learning experience the best that we can in the district. So this week, um, what Kathy Damaris and I are going to show you is sort of the heart of what's happening in the school, and that is uh, curriculum, instruction, an assessment and uh, how we teach our students. We have some curriculum coordinators here, and we also have our elementary principals here who are going to present in more detail. At the beginning, this presentation is more of a um, high-level summary of, uh, again, curriculum instruction and assessment at the district level, and uh, more specifics will be shared individually by each school shortly. So the first slide just shows the uh, functional area of district curriculum, which includes myself and a cadre of fine um, curriculum coordinators uh, that are listed there from literacy, math, technology, ELA, etc., um, that make up the department. Let's see. Uh, what we did is we uh, structured our um, budget and our goals under the strategic initiatives that Superintendent Galston had um, shared with everybody, uh, I think it was in December. And the specific one that we are structuring our work under is the strategic objective to provide all students with a rigorous, relevant, standards-based curriculum throughout our core instructional program. So this, uh, for FY19 and going forward, um, these bullet points underneath, starting with assessment, are toward that strategic objective. So the first one listed there is adopting iReady, which is an integrated blended learning program for personalized learning in grades K through nine next year. It's both diagnostic to see where the student is at that moment in time. It's, um, it gives instructional um, practices for intervention, and it also allows us to monitor the progress of the student throughout the year. So from September when our students arrive until June, it's gonna give us a lot more data um, to make sure that we're targeting our instruction in a more personalized and individualized way. So that is one, um, a, a one thing that you'll see in the budget um, asks coming forward. The second thing there is the elementary standards-based report card implementation. A large group of teachers, uh, over 30, have been working hard this year um, in developing a standards-based report card for K to five next year. 
Um, the fall next year, we're also going to have a study team for the middle school, but we're actually going to implement a standards-based report card starting in September of this year. And what that means is parents and students will have a document that tells them um, where they are working toward or progressing towards each specific standard rather than an arbitrary grade or arbitrary topic area. It's very specific to the standards. We're going to be vetting this to the teachers uh, in the next two weeks and then also to the parents before the end of June so that everybody will be familiar with this uh, before even entering into the summer. So we'll give you more information on that afterwards in the presentation. Can I ask a really quick yeah, question? absolutely. When were you planning to roll this out to the middle school? Because I know that would take a so, yeah, so next year, the FY19, that school year, yeah. there'll be a study team at the middle school, like we've done for the last two years at the elementary level, okay. to see what is, what's necessary at the middle school, because it likely won't look like the elementary, but it might have parts thereof. It may be more likely to be a combination of grades and standards. Okay, so um, would, that, would that be implemented, you think, in the, at the beginning of the FY20? 19, 20. 19, 20. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's the goal, okay. yeah. Sure. Um, another important uh, objective that we want to be met is um, the addition of two more elementary coaches. As most of you know, we have a literacy coach and a math coach this year who have been phenomenal um, teachers, and I'll share with you in a few moments from professional development, have um, appreciated that type of embedded professional development coaching. Non-evaluative, just there to uh, give answers to them, to support them. <coughs> Um, and to um, serve as classroom aides uh, in implementation of curriculum. Um, the fourth bullet down there is called Atlas Curriculum Mapping Tool, and that's K-12. All of our curriculum coordinators are working this spring to take our present curriculum maps, in, which are in varying shapes of completion, and um, upload them into this tool, this software platform, and then we're, we're filling in the gaps where there may be gaps in various um, curriculum. And over the summer, we're gonna have groups of teachers that then look at what we've done, perfect it long term, as in a year or so. Um, there'll be parts of it that every parent can go on and see the, the, the shell of it. So you'll know, oh, in first grade, our children are learning uh, this, that, and the other thing. So that's a, that's a district-wide um, implementation tool. Started this spring, and then next year, we'll, we'll unload it to teachers and unveil it. And finally, on this slide, the implementation of an um, articulated social-emotional learning program, K to five. So another cadre of dedicated teachers have been working on that starting last spring and then through this school year. Um, again, we'll be vetting it to um, teachers at upcoming faculty meetings and to parents at PTOs um, before the end of June as well. We are down to selection of between two different programs, but both of them, whichever one we go with, are research evidence-based um, and we're just going to see which one fits best. So that is money in the budget next year needed for that implementation of that. Can I ask you a little question? You may. Uh, one, that for the Atlas curriculum mapping, when do you think a parent would be able to access that information? Um, I'd be Realistic guessing right guess. now because yes. teachers haven't seen it yet. I mean, no, we're no, still like putting it in. 18 months away. I, just I would say, if I had to guesstimate, yeah. I would say by the end of next school year, we'll have the, the, the framework of it. Mm -hmm. I would say that would be a goal of ours, for okay. sure. Before that, um, one of the other things that we've been working on, especially at the elementary level, is brochures. Mm -hmm. We have some makeshift, but we're still figuring out our curriculum, mm -hmm. so that a parent could have a general brochure by grade level of what is my child doing in math this year, et cetera. So that's something we're going to be working with in tandem next year. And also, just realistically, though, I think when you go through all the curriculum, yeah. um, there might be, s that a, a majority might be done by mm -hmm. the end of next year, but there might be others right. that are in really great shape, and so we didn't prioritize them, right. Right. that might be a little bit longer. So I think one yeah. of the things that, that you guys will do is put together like a schedule, in essence, like year one, these are the curriculum that are available, year two, these are the ones that, so there's always a guarantee as yeah. to what's coming online. Okay. Um, but all of them at once would be, uh, yeah. 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 And then for the um, the SEL, is that going to be implemented K to five in the fall of eighteen? I mean, this yeah, yes. fall of eighteen. Yes, um, we've actually um, changed um, our professional development days. This year we had one in um, November and one in January. In fact, the past two years. And what we've done is we put three at the beginning of the school year before our children get back, so that we can have a concentrated amount of professional development. So teachers feel equipped um, to start the year, and it's not something that flows out in October or November. We've shifted that so that we can um, provide more support across the board um, before school begins.
Um, to continue for district curriculum, um, increased funding for classroom libraries K-8 to to support uh, literacy instruction um, and improvement of student outcomes. To expand and ensure cohesive professional development offerings, that's always a focus, and in a couple of, in the slides down, I'll give you specifically some of the stuff that we're, the teachers have asked for for next year. We're incorporating 10 marks, which is instructional software that we are piloting right now in grades three to five. Um, and next year we want to have a K-9, and it serves for remediation, for um, extending the curriculum. It, students can do it at home, um, and do do it at home, um, but we need professional development around that as well, so it's just another tool. Um, budget for continued implementation of our multi-year FLESS program, and, and Adam is here tonight if we have any questions around that, but we're going um, from K to grade two next year, so we're increasing that. And then finally, um, foundations, which is uh, we need more job embedded professional development, which we've had the last two years. And we're going to continue right now, uh, this year, um, grade two is having all of that professional development. Next year, it will be kindergarten. So by the end of next year, K one and two teachers um, will be supported in phonics instruction through foundations. So there's going to be a cohesion that goes across. But when you see all of this that I just mentioned in two slides, that's a lot of work for teachers, so I hope that uh, parents, appre I know they appreciate, but and recognize the work that it takes outside of the classroom um, and the dedication to, to learn all of this. So um, the, the embedded coaching and the professional development is key to all of this um, to make us successful. Uh, some accomplishments, uh, hard to get them on a slide, so we've de uh, decided to put a district-wide on one and then elementary and then a finally a secondary, and I know that our um, principals will probably be cheerleading some of these and some, some more that we didn't include on the slides. Um, all of our, the first one is all of our principals um, completed or are in the midst of completing, some of them, a research-based course entitled Analyzing Teaching for Student Results. Um, that emphasizes skills mastery and supports the broader district learning goals. This is an ideal, uh, it's eight full days that um, curriculum coordinators and principals are spending, which is a lot of time, um, studying um, instruction, um, assessment, and um, how to uh, better teach our, our children. And what we're going to do at the end of this year and in the summer in our leadership retreat is take from that what is the area of focus that we want to do to support our teachers. So all of us will be on the same page in terms of um, our knowledge and background and going forward with the strategic plan will tie it into that. Um, also an accomplishment this year, as I mentioned earlier, is the ATLAS, the district administrators preparing the curriculum, which is taking hours and hours of time um, so that uh, next year we can share with the teachers and expand it. Um, we have an increased co-teaching model with Ka Kathy Damaris. We'll speak a little bit more to this in a few minutes, but it's been outstanding. Um, we have a program evaluation that is currently undergoing of our ELL program um, to see uh, where are the needs. Uh, Dr. Berta Alina Rojas um, is doing this, uh, this evaluation currently and next year we have um, our CPR which is now changed another acronym. <laughs> Kathy, what is it? Uh, year? Tiered Focus Monitoring. Now it's called Tiered Focus Monitoring, so TFM it will be instead of Coordinate Program Review. Um, so in preparation for that, we're getting an outside consultant to take a look at our ELL program. Um, to that end, this morning I spent the half a day in a Boston public school, a K-12 school actually in Brighton, um, with Avon and Dara, who is our um, curriculum coordinator for ELL, and with one of our ELL teachers, um, studying how they um, deliver instruction for their ELLs, which was phenomenal. So part of that um, work we'll share at, an, at a later date, but um, is, is going to be sharing that with Berta Alina too going forward. Um, and then uh, another district-wide accomplishment was um, additional opportunities for inclusion of all students in the arts. So Reach Out Music at the high school is a beautiful class um, that some of you might be aware of. And then also Adaptive Music at the Hosmer. So <coughs> just different ways outside an academic classroom that we are making sure all students are included. <coughs> Elementary accomplishments. Um, I'll kind of whiz through these, I know. It was hard, believe me. Uh, there were three slides and Dee said, Teresa, can you get that to one slide? I'm like, all right, I'll try, but it's made the font that. smaller. Nine, because it takes a lot of this background work so that we can see the outcomes change. The outcomes don't change in one school year, they change when you have this committed resource uh, through our budget. So, for example, we shifted Title I funds. Um, when I started last year, they were at the high school and the middle school. It's where we spent our federal funds for Title I. Um, 
we didn't think that that was the best use of them. We wanted it at the elementary level, so we were able to do that. So this year at the Hosmer and at the Lowell. Lowell, sorry, at the Lowell, we have Title I tutors in both math and ELA. And um, Elizabeth and Allison are doing um, wonderful work in supporting that, that Title I funding there, so that will make a difference over time as well. Um, systematic foundations, phonics instructions in grade one and two. Um, that's what we accomplished this year. Next year, I'll be up here saying, and Kay also. Um, we introduced um, the effective math coaching and collaborating um, this year. We did uh, math benchmarks in unit assignments and all elementary data meetings, which are coming up at the end of March, actually, um, which we hadn't had last year. We have Chromebook carts in grades three to five and interactive whiteboards in all grade one classrooms this year, which is very exciting for students. In fact, that, that visit that I had to this Boston classroom this morning, um, there were 22 students in it, and it was a fourth grade classroom, and they all had various colors, headphones on, and they were doing a program called uh, Imagine Learning, um, a very a blended learning program, and uh, it, it was the engagement in the classroom was remarkable. And these are students who are ELL students um, one through three, so that means really learning a language um, at, a, at a rudimentary level. So um, we're excited to have that technology at our lower levels. Um, implementation of readers' workshops. We have 13 lab teachers or lab classrooms, which means they're w wonderful to allow other teachers to come in and see what's happening. They're getting coaching from our consultants from TLA. Um, there's actually 20 teachers involved because some are co-teachers, right? So you'll have a special educator and a gen ed teacher in that classroom. But 13 of the elementary classrooms across all three elementary schools have these lab classrooms, which we're continuing next year with professional development support as well. Um, the implementation, of course, of FLESS in K and 1 both, and next year too. Um, ADOPT in purchases is very exciting. Um, Lucy Calkins research-based units of study for teachers, teachers um, to start next year K to 5. So their summer present will be this package, um, wonderful uh, resource. Um, and also, a lot of teachers are dedicating their time at the end of this school year, provided we don't have any more snow days. Um, and they're actually going to work in a two to three day institute with these units of study ahead of time so that, one, they can feel uh, a little bit uh, better coming back in the fall and not so overwhelmed. Um, but two, just to get a head start on, on using that. And you'll see in another slide, I'm connecting this because we have some quotes from teachers who took professional development, and in it, their request was, please, please, we want more units of study to be able to do that. So it's nice to be able to have that in the budget from their requests as well. We have 18 math teacher leaders this year, which we didn't have before, that form the District Elementary Math Task Force and work with Elizabeth Kaplan closely and with um, our math coach as well. And we've introduced 10 marks, as I mentioned, grades three to five this year, K to nine next year. And we've expanded our percussion program, grade five and six through eight. So we've, as, as Meg tells me, we are getting back to, I guess, where the district was a few years ago before in terms of offerings for students um, at the elementary level. Okay. Second, oh, yes, Just please. Ask, the, the teacher leaders, 18 mm -hmm. math teacher leaders, mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about what they do as a teacher leader? Yeah, in fact, I'm going to let later? I'm going to let Elizabeth uh, not later, right now. That would be great yeah, if you absolutely. could just. So there's one math teacher leader at every grade level in every school, and it is a, a new thing for them to um, be teacher leaders. And so we've done a lot of work. Um, I've actually realized we've done a lot of work on how they can collaborate with their colleagues as math leaders. But the the big thing that they've done is we had a summer. Institute where we really did some visioning on where do we where do we want to be in the future with our math program and where were we and what do we need to do in between and what came out of it is that we lacked common assessments we mm -hmm. didn't collect math data our curriculum wasn't fully aligned to the standards and then that was our work for this year so we've with the math coach who's who's a wonderful wonderful um, staff member and myself and the leaders, we've written grade level scope and sequences, so basically curriculum maps that use math and focus but really tightly aligned to the standards. There were some disparities. So those are going into Atlas, um, the will are going into Atlas, and they are writing unit assessments. So they wrote, um, our, our math coach wrote benchmark assessments, which we gave at the beginning of the year, we'll give at the end of the year, and now we have actual district common math unit assessments um, mm -hmm. that they are collaborating on. So um, they're, they're, they're working really hard. Um, we are sending them to a little bit of outside professional development. We do rely on them to um, make sure that their colleagues feel comfortable with everything that's going on, um, and it's, it's been successful. 
do they, they do observations or kind of co-teaching or will No, they? our math coach does that. Okay. Um, that's really her role. They, um, what they do is grade level team meetings, common planning time, times where principals can't, can't be there. Yeah. Um, they, are, aren't, they will run data meetings. They will go over things with people. They will support them. They ought, it's really nice because we have a nice system in that we're not writing these assessments Elefteria, the math coach and I, and sending them to everybody. We're having a teacher leader help do it. Mm -hmm. So when we send everything out, there's much less problems. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a nice kind of system. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One is, um, uh, when is, when is, are these um, teacher leaders going to the middle school and kind of, when is it going to move up? I'm not, I'm not sure. I've been, this year I've been working with Dan um, Wolf, who's our 6 to 12 coordinator, more closely than we have in the past because now that we are aligned so we can do that vertical alignment more. Um, I, I'm not, Teresa, can you answer about the middle school? Yeah. I'm not sure if they have that on the... So we've been focused this year on elementary. Mm -hmm. Next year our focus is shifting because we're going to have completed the standards-based report card. Mm -hmm. We're going to have completed the decision on um, social-emotional learning. Mm -hmm. So we're going to shift to the middle school. Now what the needs are at the middle school are very different because they have teams. They're content -based. You know, They're it's content. one yeah. school and they have yeah. teams versus the elementary is three schools individual teachers so it requires a lot more so I'm not sure that structure will right. be necessary but we'll know better next year right. when we look at it dig in yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so one one other thing if you remember from last Monday yeah. um, in the, the items that weren't fun, currently funded for this year yeah. that were requested yeah. we had a, a literacy coach and a steam coach for the middle school yeah. um, so I, we left those up there to kind of message the fact that yeah. um, we think moving forward that that's going to be a great model for um, middle schools so I think that that's a, another way that we're going to support our teachers. Hopefully. But you've worked, I, I know you, you said you've worked on that, that kind of grade five to grade six yeah. articulation. This year we're working more, we've worked in the past on it, but it, I don't feel that we were that effective because we had problems, like for example, our fifth grade math and focus curriculum was actually teaching sixth grade standards. Yeah. So there was a little bit of repetition when kids got to sixth grade. Right. This year we're really digging in and doing the work more closely because we are newly aligned to the standards. So Dan and I have talked, we're going to get the math teacher leaders together, the fifth grade ones, with the sixth grade teachers um, very soon. So that's, that's never happened before. Okay. So it's getting better that way. Um, yeah. And one more question. In terms of the, the benchmarks that the teacher yes. leaders wrote, so those, every, every teacher yes. uses now those same benchmarks. And we also collect the data at a district level for every school, every teacher. Um, and Allison and I are running all elementary grade level data meetings next week to look at all the literacy data and everything. Um, so yes, everybody's implementing them. We, we for the math, it's, it's standards based, it's not curriculum based, so it is like MCAS, um, and it is in students, um, we have item analysis, so we're using the item analysis, and so we've come a long way with math assessment this year. I'll be interested to see growth because since you did the, the June, September, yeah, yep, to yep. the June, looking at mm -hmm. what that because that's what I will present. Month. I will will present September. September. Okay, yeah. or October, whichever. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your work. And it'll be great to start next year with the previous year's end of year benchmark, which right. we never had, and so with I ready. Yeah, yeah. Right. That will make yeah because then we'll have more monitoring, not just yeah until June. Not just yeah. 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 So at the secondary level, I'm um, mm -hmm. very excited to be in a district where we have full deployment of 101 Chromebooks grades 6 through 12, completed that this year. Uh, new art courses, adding drawing one and painting one at the high school. New jazz band and middle school choral accompanists, because those were on our list to ask for last year, makes a big difference for the student experience in a chorus class. Development of a new U.S. history curriculum scope and sequence, you can embedding more project-based learning into that. Uh, development of uh, an implementation implementation of thematic units and PBL in 6 through 11 at the end of the last school year we had a three-day Buck Institute training for project-based learning so this school year teachers in uh, either uh, small groups or in departments are embedding a project or two depending upon the department into um, it's just much more authentic experience we want to get much more into that next year um, uh, at the high school, they had a successful pilot of a semester called, course called Introduction to Computer Programming Python. Um, uh, Dr. Galston brought in professional <coughs> learning teams, and one of them at the high school was SAT versus ACT, and they did an alignment and analysis of the exams within the curriculum, and teachers across different dif disciplines at the high school met to um, analyze an SAT, what's required for an SAT, what's required for an ACT, um, and what the needs were in the curriculum based on that. 
We expanded Project Lead the Way at the high school, and the path now includes three courses and a capstone course. We implemented um, Project Lead the Way at the middle school via enrichment courses, which are um, highly engaging for students. And we had three consecutive trips abroad, to, not in one year, but um, to provide authentic learning opportunities for students. So Costa Rica twice, Italy, and then Spain next year. And our foreign language department has been supporting that. Um, so budget priorities K to 12, as I mentioned, um, Atlas curriculum mapping tool, the cost, um, the rationale, I think we've gone over. And the funding source, uh, one thing to pay particular attention to in this column of funding sources, I've written whether it's district curriculum level budget, it's a federal grant that we're using for it, or if it's a priority in our budget this year. So I tried to delineate in between some of these. Um, the second one, the iReady assessment and intervention, um, it's a district curriculum recommended budget priority, um, which you'll see uh, the list that Mary, I think, showed us last week, above the line, the ones, that was one of them. And at the elementary level, the budget priorities, uh, classroom libraries, the big cost there that you see, but that's every classroom in the elementary schools. Um, appropriate levels of engaging text to support the implementation of our readers workshop. And that's coming from the regular day budget, um, recommended budget, priority one edition. The literacy coach, uh, we have one, and uh, one between three schools is uh, a challenge, but nice to have. Um, two is better. Um, uh, as teachers will say, uh, it's non-evaluative and it's entirely being coached just like a sports team would be coached. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So we're asking for a literacy coach and um, that's a level service budget, budget item because there's an existing unfilled position. So that's not something that's going, we're going to add to next year's budget, but we just want to put it out there because it is a priority. So we're re refunding those. Foundations in kindergarten to continue that and that's from the um, level service budget. Ongoing professional development and in-class literacy coaching, and that's the Teaching and Learning Alliance, TLA, we use that acronym in. That's continuing with them this year, so Allison and I meet closely with the folks from TLA and say, we look at what we've done this year, and then what are the needs going forth next year. Tomorrow, if there's no snow, we have a cadre of 17, how many people do we have? 18, 18 teachers and a couple of district folks going to a school in Framingham um, to do guided tours of classrooms um, that TLA is working with and taking notes, the meeting with the teachers, a really rich experience and that's part of that. Um, down to a math coach, um, expanding coaching from one coach to two coaches. Um, elementary health exploratory process. So. Um, Joe Lampman and myself met with our elementary health teachers and had a good meeting at a department meeting last month. And they're going to um, investigate, do a study next year on um, what's needed at the elementary level. Um, they're going to study different districts to see. I, we already have started some of it. Um, you know, do we do grades three to five? Do we do K to five? You know, what do we do? So we're just looking at elementary health. And that's part of our bigger goal on social emotional learning. It's not just a social emotional learning program that a core teacher does, it's across the district. So that's just one example of something we want to look at. And then finally, um, world languages, some curriculum development for new curriculum for FLESS. At the secondary level, some budget priorities include um, summer project lead the way training. That's a continuous thing, as you're all aware. Um, that's a budget two priority addition from the recommended budget. Um, 10 marks instructional software um, for the middle school and uh, up to ninth grade, I believe Dan was going to try that one. Um, and 6 to 12 professional development on standards courses, implementation of the new U.S. History 2 course, um, and that's coming from a couple, it's a budget two and regular day, so I guess it's coming out of both budgets is what I understand from that. And finally, uh, for digital learning, ninth grade Chromebooks, that's a four-year refresh cycle, so that's a big number, $50,000, but computers, as you know, have to be replaced, um, so that's part of their refresh cycle. And finally, the, oh, go right ahead. I just, I just want to um, mention that when you look at, at the fact that, as, as Teresa pointed out, that either of these things were already in the operating budget or that they were priorities, et cetera, um, one of the things that we, we emphasize this year is, you know, re-examine re what you're already doing within the level services budget. And if you want to move things around because you think there's a better way to do that, the principal's engaged in that work as well as the district leaders. 
Um, and I think next year the excitement will be that you know when we have a, an improvement strategy that's been developed, um, we'll align all of these directly to the objectives. I mean, they already they already are to our short term objectives, but I think next year you'll see a, a greater line as to why it is that these are our priorities. Um, so I, I'm very excited about how everything's starting to really come together, and that we are really looking at all of our funding to move the district forward, not just the the extra that we're we have in terms of the the delta between the 4.2 and the 5. So. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, that's great. Um, and a little bit on professional development. Um, so these data are showing you um, some feedback at the secondary level from teachers who um, <clears throat> participated in our January um, full day professional development. And on this chart, basically what you see is, number one is, um, did the presenter deliver an organized, engaging presentation? And when 92% of teachers um, say on a scale of one to five from least true to most true, I think that's a, it's a really good percentage that they felt it was quality and it was what they asked for. But more importantly is the second, um, the second chart there, the information learned in the session was useful to me in better understanding or in working with my students. So 84% were in the four or five most true categories. Um, so it's, it's pretty good feedback because, you know, it's hard to, we have, uh, how many people total in the district, Mary? What would you say? Um, Just under 600. Yeah, a lot. And so it's, it's a challenge to meet the needs of all, but the better we can do that, the better outcomes for students. So it's feeling good about that. Some quantitative feedback from professional development at the elementary levels. Um, so at the very bottom, it's CPR training, TLA that we told you about for literacy, and the units of study for literacy, and then FLES. Those were the four categories. Um, the blue line is indicating information learned in the session will be useful to me in better understanding or in working with my students. And as you can see, they're all above four, some close to five. So that's a great outcome. Um, the presenter in the session delivered an organized, engaging presentation. Again, above the four, close to the five, and finally, Overall, I recommend this session to my colleague, all above the four, um, closer to the five. So that's good feedback from teachers uh, appreciating the professional development that they're doing. Some qualitative um, notes on this. Um, I'm not gonna read them. These are three examples from the literacy work that was done um, this year. But what I think is important is a couple of lines in the first square I've highlighted in my notes, very, very applicable to what I do in the classroom, plus all the other stuff use it in my daily instruction. These are the kinds of things that we want to see, not like nice idea, I don't think we can ever implement it. Um, and the second one down there, um, I appreciated being able to look at data to drive our instructions. When you have teachers saying that, it's like, it's juice to us when you hear teachers saying that, that's fantastic. Um, and then they're also saying, I look forward to learning more about units of study. And the units of study is what I showed you in the prior slide that we're purchasing for all K to five teachers. Finally, in the bottom right hand corner, uh, the presenter was very clear on how to implement them, and I will need significantly more leveled readers. So when they write that, in that number I just showed you of $55,000, which is a lot of books for a lot of classrooms, we're supporting teachers in, in, in what they're requesting. And then in mathematics and science, these are just a couple more um, examples. On the top one, uh, I'll bring your eyes to the section that says, integrating science into literacy blocks. And these are teachers saying they want to know how to do this and they appreciate what they've gotten so far. Uh, in math down there, it says another integration. These are their words, which I love to read. Integration into the math workshop and how I can do it outside the math block, uh, that they are learning this. This is, this is excellent. And finally, in the bottom right corner, the part I like the most is um, collaborate and work with other special educators around math. Um, so overall, the, the feedback is, is very positive. This coming forward this year, um, our budget goal again tied to the strategic objectives that were outlined in December. The budget goal is to support educators' instructional practice to meet the needs of all of our students in expanding and ensuring cohesive professional development. So for next year, our PD will be surfacing around new social emotional learning program. Obviously, we need to support teachers in that. The elementary standards-based report card implementation, developing rubrics, curriculum, unit assignments, all of that, that will be aligned. So when, you're when your child takes an end of uh, unit assessment, each question on it will be aligned to the report card, to a standard on there. It's not nebulous, so it's very structured in that way. Uh, it takes a lot of work, though, for us and teachers to, to plan that. 
Um, understanding by design, that's part of our atlas work that we're doing. What do we want students to know at the end and how do we get them there? Um, and how do we make sure that they can transfer that skill? How do they have autonomy in deciding how they want to learn that? All of that stuff. Um, it's a concentration K to 12 next year. For literacy, again, TLA year two implementation next year. Foundations year three to kindergarten. Uh, differentiated instruction across K-12. Expansion of interdisciplinary project-based learning and performance-based assessments. Curriculum development continues, that's, that's important. Uh, vertically aligning, like we were just discussing, between fifth and sixth grade and certainly eighth and ninth grade. Uh, mathematics is one example. Um, elementary health curriculum study and planning that I mentioned. Um, using Chromebooks in the classroom for more personalized learning. Um, we, we got great, we have great um, technology. Uh, we've been supported by the town um, and by the school board, uh, the school committee to be able to um, procure so much technology, but we need ongoing professional development to uh, engage our students and our teachers. And finally, training in 10 marks, grades six to nine. Here um, outlines the uh, budget summary and numbers. Salaries. Uh, this is this, this is Mary's territory a little bit. Numbers. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to point out, and we pointed this out earlier too, that uh, it's a little bit deceiving. Um, we didn't cut one one point three million dollars out of Teresa's budget. We reallocated curriculum coordinators to building level, and I think we've stated that a couple of times. When all was said and done, it was equivalent uh, to I think a nine point four FTEs that got redistributed out of the district curriculum back to the regular day building budgets based on their role. So, for example. Um, Elizabeth is now, her salary is attributed to the three elementary schools, split a third, a third, a third. Allison split between the three elementary schools and the middle school, so those are sort of examples of, of why that, that happened. Most of what she was oh, talking about in terms of the funding was, um, was um, attributed to regular day, so you don't see it necessarily in this summary. Um, and then there was, you can see there's some re reallocation that happened between, say, other expenditures and supplies and materials. So overall, this, this budget is relatively stable other than those reallocations. And a lot of what you saw is the recommendations are coming from the regular day budgets. Um, and before we move on to student service, sort of in summary, I think all of us have a, a keen awareness um, of the need for um, supporting our students' social emotional wellness in schools and outside of schools. So the program from K to 5 that will start next year is one way of doing it, but we're looking at, a, at, at as a strategic goal overall. So when I talked about looking at the health curriculum, that's another way. When the high school is looking at changing their schedule and including more advisory, that's another way. When I talk about looking at um, middle school next year and how um, their S social emotional program is and what their advisory looks like, that's another way. So it's not just one thing, it's many across. And I think we can all agree that that um, is just as important as academic achievement. <coughs> Any questions before I move it over to my colleague, Kathy Damaris, to talk about student services? Does anyone in the audience have questions? You should feel free. Um, how are you evaluating the success of, especially um, the foundation's um, implementation? Um, through, well, through Allison is, um, oh, man, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I will. I will. So I'll let you tell well, your, your um, goal. So in um, grade one, when they first implemented last year, um, they had ongoing professional development. And year one, it's sort of hard. You're, you're really struggling just to learn to implement it within the time allotted because it is a program with many components. Um, but we keep data, um, we have multiple measures that we use. So we have benchmark data, which is their overall reading level when they integrate the skills. But then we also have uh, QPS, which is a quick phonics screener that we give K to five, three times a year. Um, and each section of that breaks out different components of phonics. Um, and so we can see um, they did it in September, they just did it again in March, um, and that's part of the data that we'll show the teachers um, this week is analyzing and keeping that. So one thing that's different this year is that every school is using the same formatted data grid, um, so we can compile the information pretty easily from all three buildings and then um, reflect it back to teachers. Additionally, 
foundations itself has a um, progress monitoring tool which is every unit test teachers enter into a data tracker as well and I have access to that as well so we can see even just based on um, weekly unit tests where are kids falling down and needing um, retesting so we've done work with coaching um, at the second grade level this year um, and also going back and looking at the fidelity of implementation in first grade um, I've been visiting each um, classroom with the building principals to look at um, you were trained last year in first grade how's it going is it still being implemented with fidelity um, and ongoing coaching for that thank you sure well Kathy it's all yours all right. oh. Um, so hi, I'm Kathy Damaris, I'm the Director of Student Services here in Watertown. Um, just a little bit of um, context, that's a new title for me this year. Um, when I was hired, I was the Director of um, Special Education, so there's a little bit more to, um, to the areas that I've overseen this school year. The major functional areas that fall currently under Student Services are Special Education. Um, we have coordinators, team chairs, related service providers, so your um, occupational therapists, your speech-language pathologists, um, physical therapists, um, BCPAs sorry, board, board certified behavior analysts, um, our teachers and instructional assistants. We also have behavioral health and social emotional support. Um, and under that kind of umbrella, we have guidance counselors, school psychologists, social workers, school adjustment counselors. Oh, I put the BCBs there. Okay, and also behavior specialists. Um, our nursing services fall under student services and also out of district tuition and transportation. This is just a slide that shows you in general how many students um, in each school currently are um, identified as having special education needs and having IEPs. And some of our accomplishments this year um, were training for principals and guidance counselors regarding 504 plans, civil rights, and responsibilities in regards to bullying and harassment. Uh, nurses have successfully implemented SNAP which is their school nurses student information system that was new for them this year and they've um, done that successfully. We also implemented our power school special education system for IEPs last up to last school year we were using a system called easy IEP. Um, this was a lot of work for our special educators and related services providers it was not uh, it was not easy to learn this new system. The uh, significant benefits are that um, it speaks to our student information system so it, we went through the um, I, I passed to power school change over last year for all students um, and so throughout that whole first year for me um, and even prior um, I passed didn't talk to easy IEP and power school didn't talk to easy IEP so we were kind of on our own um, sometimes the if, if a parent moved um, the address wouldn't be updated the IEP might get mailed to another address would be delays um, but now we have this, a, the systems talk to each other even more powerful is that now our general education teachers, every teacher um, that sees a student has access through their PowerSchool portal to be able to, to view the documents for those students um, electronically. So that's a huge um, win for us. We've provided ongoing job embedded training to all of our instructional assistants, a couple of here tonight, um, with, through the Accept Collaborative with Elise Stokes. Um, and that has provided for us kind of a common framework so that every instructional assistant across the district has the same training and ideas about um, what the role is, how do we fade our support, how do we promote independence for our children, um, because that's our goal. Um, we also had job embedded training and coaching provided to our new and veteran co-teaching pairs at Watertown High School, a little bit um, with the middle school as well with Kathy Porcaro, um, and we're continuing to work with her. She's going to be putting together a train-the-trainer model to help build the internal capacity to continue um, with inclusive practices, including co-teaching. Um, Teacher-led professional development on co-teaching was offered and well-received um, during the January training. And our first secondary transition fair for students 14 through 22 and their parents and guardians is planned for April 2018. We had, as well, what's a transition fair? Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. Um, so a transition fair, so students with disabilities um, are eligible until, for services up until they either earn their diploma or turn 22. Um, and then very often they may need some additional services 
and supports as they're making that transition into their adulthood, whether that means college or whether into the world of work. Um, and so that's an important period of time for school and for families and for students um, to start to learn not to be so reliant on all of the supports that they have in the school setting and to learn what it's going to be like um, in adulthood um, because those entitlements uh, go away, um, essentially. Um, but there are other things under Section 504 that they may have entitlements to. So a transition fair is where um, parents and students learn about all of the different um, agencies that are available to help students with that transition. So for milder disabilities, it might be the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. Um, they can provide often um, some training, some supports, um, driver's education um, evaluations to see if it's worth, uh, you know, if a student has the capacity to earn you know, their, to <coughs> their driver's license, those kinds of things. Um, Mass Commission for the Blind for students who are visually impaired, um, and the Department of Developmental Services for students who have significant intellectual disabilities um, and or autism. Um, so they learn those things. Um, so we had our common corners established in selected pilot classrooms across the elementary schools. So this was an idea um, to have, instead of our, um, so much our opportunity rooms, which are, are still um, functioning in some of our elementary schools, but to start to bring um, that opportunity into the classroom so that students who are having a, a difficulty with dysregulation, instead of having to exit the classroom and miss all that rich instruction, have an opportunity to, um, to kind of calm themselves within the classroom setting. Um, the integrated support program opened at the Lowell um, Elementary School, and that was something we talked about in the last budget cycle. Um, it was kind of a missing piece in our continuum of services so that our little ones at the elementary level, if they needed, um, substantially separate services, if they needed services for the majority of their school day, would have to be outplaced. They weren't able to stay within, um, within the Watertown Public Schools. So that was um, very exciting. Um, and I do have to credit, Stacy will be split speaking, um, but as the, the principal at the Lowell, really um, led um, a fantastic opening of that program. Wonderful teacher um, in Laura Holman, um, our behavior specialist, um, Brian Connors, and our guidance counselor, um, counselor, sorry, um, Hope, Rotaro and um, Veronica Knight were key in that, as well as um, Kelly, our school psychologist. Um, so just kudos to the Lowell for that being so successful. Um, and we actually have a student who had been outplaced last year with no options that is um, very excited to be looking to see if they can come back um, for the start of the 2018-2019 school year to that program. Um, and then support for students' mental health needs has been very much in the news and in our minds as um, we've had um, some very terrible events um, take place and we um, took a look at what, 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 where, where we're at. at. Um, and so the American School Counselors Association recommends um, no more than 250 students for every one mental health counselor, so guidance counselor, school adjustment counselor, social worker, those that we were counting in that category, did not count psychologists. Um, so, and the state's average in Massachusetts is one such counselor to every 493 students. These are our numbers. So at the high school, we have one um, counselor for every 102 students. What, middle school, one for every 131. Cosmo, one for every 147. Um, Lowell, one for 167. Kind of one for 153. So that is um, tremendous um, support that we have in that. Kathy, can I ask you a question about yes. that? Yes. Um, I thought I remember one of the items that is being rearranged or reallocated is some counseling. How does that affect these numbers? Because that in, was an elementary counselor, right? It, it is, Point yeah. It has, a, it has a minor impact. Um, I don't have like the math on that slide, but we'll talk about it when we get to, the, to, to that kind of um, looking at that. It's a good question. Okay. I mean, just, just to refresh also yes. is that, and I know you're going to talk about this, but um, the community outreach social worker is a district level position, but that's that's also somebody who will then be providing support for for students at the school. And the addition of the assistant principal, although they don't count in that ratio, mm -hmm. um, we will have an additional adult within the building that will be supporting students, um, you know, who are who might be struggling. So it's right. although they, they might not fall in there, they are there. Um, just want to make sure we remember that. One. Absolutely. And when we get to that slide, um, I think that one of the things that we've seen and Stacy has identified is that um, a lot of um, tasks were, were given to guidance counselors that the um, ACFC, sorry, ASCA um, kind of frowns on it, that it's, so it's less kid time, it's more kind of administrative work, um, and that's something that would then be reallocated to the assistant principal position that was recommended for that. Thanks, Ken. Can, can you say again which positions are considered in that ratio? Yes. 
That is your guidance counselors, yeah. school adjustment counselors, and social workers. Okay. Thanks. Karen, since you're here this evening, do you want to? Sure. Um, so for the Early Steps program, um, we are hoping the weather has not been cooperating too much for, mm -hmm. for March um, for us to be having our turning three, but hopefully finding the time either in April or May to have an information night for parents to be able to figure out about um, developmental processes in regards to their children turning three and when they're ready for the integrated preschool program either through um, an evaluation for an IEP or as a community child to be um, part of our, our program. So um, we're hoping to have one in during the daytime and then also at night so that this way we can help meet the needs of all of the um, parents. We um, modeled after the elementary schools to have a general education team process also known as GET. And what that does is allow us to look at some of our um, community children who are enrolled in our preschool currently and see if there is a suspected disability that would require an evaluation. Sometimes students come in as a community child or typical child at the time, but once they're in, we do, based on our highly qualified staff, notice that there are some areas that may spark some red flags. So we're able to implement some, which ties into the tiered system of supports, some of our um, support systems for general ed students and be able to see if they're responding to the interventions or if there is something that we feel is a suspected disability that would require testing. So um, it has been a very successful model. We've had a couple of students that have really responded well to the um, interventions that have been provided, so therefore not requiring at this particular time the need for um, an evaluation to do for special education services. So we keep monitoring even after the um, strategies are being implemented just to make sure that none of the students just hit it that first couple of times that we're looking at the benchmark assessment that they are continuously making strides and developing along the continuum that we're looking for. And the last thing echoes what Kathy was saying <coughs> earlier is that we have been providing some job embedded coaching for our educational assistants and also our teachers through the Accept Collaborative. So there are two times during the month um, on the Monday afternoon times when students are dismissed and we don't have our afternoon sessions where um, the IAs and the teachers will work together at a professional development time or it'll just be the the IAs themselves having time with Elise to be able to work on different topics. Um, Elise and I do collaborate for what we feel would be good topics to be working on. Um, some of them is the fading of supports for students that have a one-to-one -one or that have a shared IA, what that looks like, what are some ways to track and to record data for behavior. We work a lot on making sure that we're collecting that accurate information. And then also, how can we as a team, when we're looking at the teachers and the IAs together, what is the best strategies for helping and supporting our classrooms? What does that look like and how can we continue to improve our practice? We have a lot of longevity in our staff at the preschool, which is something to be said for staff wanting to stay. And so sometimes those refreshers are really good to have just to refresh our bag of tricks on ways that we can continue to support our students. Um, I did want to point out as well that um, the preschool IAs, um, Elise Stokes actually piloted um, the module that she's working on this year with the rest of the staff with our preschool IAs in the spring was very well received. Um, and this year it's more looking at the whole the partnership. And so we're um, looking, considering that for, um, for next year. Uh, you know, what do the teachers need to know as well when working with um, an instructional assistant as a support person in the classroom? Thank you. So goals for um, fiscal year 19, um, I think not terribly different from what we've had in the past in supporting you know, the district goals. Um, so continuation of professional development is a big thing um, and job better coaching as well for our general education teachers, our special education <coughs> teachers, our administrators, and our instructional assistants in improving inclusive practices for all students. And we'll talk in some further slides about why is inclusion so important. 
Um, increasing parent outreach via the CPAC, informal copies, the Student Services Administration, and district-led parent information and training sessions um, will continue to be a goal. Um, CPAC has had a bit of a struggle, so we're hoping to have some parents that will step up and, um, and help out. We had a parent that moved over the um, summer, um, and we have our current chairperson is going to be stepping down. It, it is a lot of, a lot of work, um, and she was kind of flying solo. So um, anyone that you know that would help um, and it is a time commitment. It's important to be able to meet with me at least once a month um, to kind of help um, help stay in touch. Um, and then continued focus on closing our achievement gaps and improving outcomes for students with disabilities. Um, so why is inclusion important? Um, it's mandated. It's, it's, it's law. Okay, I, I like to use that, but that's only one little part of why it's important. Um, the de definition is assuring that students with disabilities are educated with students who are not disabled to the maximum extent appropriate. Um, at our placement definitions when we're talking, um, full inclusion, um, people sometimes misinterpret that to mean that you, you cannot step foot outside of the classroom. That's not accurate. You can have some pull out and still be considered fully included. So it's just that 80% of more of your day is spent in the um, regular classroom. Partial inclusion, um, they're 41 to 79% of their day in the regular classroom. And substantially separate, 60% or more of the school day um, is segregated. Um, inclusion benefits all students, not just students with, with disabilities. Uh, in the practices for, for, for beneficial and inclusive settings are beneficial for all students. Disability is a form of human diversity, and we don't segregate based on you know, diversity. We need to learn to live with diverse humans. Um, and we're going to talk about Dr. Thomas Hare's research from Massachusetts. And the district data, when we look at Dr. Hare's research, we're going to see our district data kind of follows that same trend. So this slide we showed last year. I don't know that I spent a lot enough time on it. And I also saw that um, some formatting issues, we lost the key. So just so you know, I'm going to tell you the blue is um, students that are not um, low income, and the green is students that are low income, as you're looking at those bars. But what Dr. Tom, did, Dr. Tom Hare did over Massachusetts, he took all data. Um, for students with disabilities. Um, and he looked at not our students that are significantly disabled, so not our students with significant cognitive disabilities, not our students with severe autism, um, not, not that group. He's looking at students with mild, high incidence disabilities. So these are specific learning disabilities, communication disabilities, and health, generally your ADHD students. Um, so students who you're going to expect will be earning diplomas, going on to, you know, to work and to college and, um, and to independence. Um, and he, he separated out for, for um, all kinds of factors so that they're really similar students um, and just looked at what the difference was in their MCAS scores um, by placement. So on the left, you have students who are fully included. Um, in the middle, you have partial inclusion. And um, towards the right, you have students that, are, that were substantially um, separate, that were, that were learning in segregated settings. So you can see that there is an impact, that, the, that your placement does matter. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, is there, I'm going to make an assumption, and you tell me if I'm wrong, that if, if you have a child that's included 80 to 100% of the day versus a child that is included 0 to 40% of the day, there's probably a, some, some difference in terms of the, the, the disability or the needs that they require that could have an impact on their MCAS score, too. So not necessarily. I think that when you start to look at how um, different districts place students, and Dr. Tom's, Dr. sorry, Dr. Hare's report goes through that um, at length, um, then you start to see that, that that's not actually what the answer is. Um, and, and it does have to do with poverty. Um, it's a very interesting report, and I will definitely share it um, with you so you can read that through. Um, you were going to say something, Dee No, no, no. Okay. I was just going to echo exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's almost, I've seen also data that looks at, you know, um, similar students, you know, same type of profile, yeah. who are those which are in substantially separate classrooms versus those which are fully included, same, you know, same disability, whatever it might be, yeah. and they just achieve that much more mm -hmm. in the inclusive, inclusive setting. It's and placement I, practices of the yes. district. Okay. Yeah, so it's not necessarily disability related, it's, it's our own practices. Okay. Yeah, and that is, <laughs> that is the, the first go-to that people assume when they're seeing this this data, and that's why this slide, I always point out, this is our very mildly disabled students. These are, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's specific learning, communication, health. 
these are disabilities where we actually expect they won't always need to have an IEP. Mm -hmm. This is statewide, though. This is not. This is not Watertown. This is the whole state. This was a okay. huge study that was um, commissioned by the state of Massachusetts. Gotcha. Yes. So we're going to now look at Watertown. Okay. Thank you. Um, so again, this this goes 2012 through 2016, and it's Watertown. It's all grades, kind of all put together, um, and your yellow line there for this, so this is advanced or proficient on the MCAS test. Um, your yellow line is students without disabilities. Your blue line is students with disabilities who are um, fully included. Your red line is students with disabilities who are partially included. And your red line is, I'm sorry, to teal, green. teal line <laughs> is um, students who are in substantially separate settings. Um, what I want to point out about this as well, because people start to think about our students that we know will maybe always um, need support, who maybe aren't going to be earning a diploma, those students aren't taking the MCAS test, they're doing an MCAS alt. That, those, that is not reflected in this graph, so that's not who these students are. So what you're saying is um, there's a marked increase in students in full inclusion. Yeah, that graph's going in the right direction. You know, there's that, that, they, that gap was being closed in 2016 for sure, for that group. But the difference between fully included and partially included is, um, is huge. Um, so again, that had to stop in 2016. We couldn't extend that graph because we had <coughs> PARC and we had MCAS 2.0. Right. And so we, we took a look at what happened. Um, grade 10, because it was the same test. So this is a trend line. So this is math by placement. So again, your yellow line is your students without disabilities. Um, your blue line is students fully included. That, um, that blue one at the bottom is your partial included students. Mm -hmm. Your substantially separate students are not represented because the number was too low. Mm -hmm. like there weren't enough students to be, to be represented uh, in the state data. Sample size. Sample size, sample size, sample size thank you. Yes, thank you. Huh. And then English. I liked 2016, <laughs> where we had no achievement gap there with our students who are fully included. Um, and you kind of see the same trend, and again, the substantially separate, the, the um, sample size, the, the N was too low. I think in general it's kind of important for us to remember, just from a math teacher talking right now, is that the sample size is in general really small, because Watertown's a small yeah. district, which Correct. is why it's jumping. Right. And yeah, especially yeah, yeah, the students who have disabilities, yeah. like, this is not a normal way to see trends. We have such a small sample size, there could be large variation yes. because cohort of to cohort. cohort to cohort because of the right. students that are there. So. Um, but in Thomas, there's work, doesn't he? He has a large sample. Yes, exactly. Yes. Right, we're just, yeah, I like yes. how you've shown this. Huge sample. Yes. Um, so this was how things came out last year with our Next Generation Math MCAS performance. Um, so your, um, what are we calling it an orange square, Mary? Did we go with orange square? Mm -hmm. um, students okay. without disabilities. Um, your um, blue dot is students with disabilities who are fully included, and then that X, at, down there is the um, students who are partially included. Mm -hmm. And this is grades three through eight ELA. Um, same thing. So that's, a, that's something we want to tackle for sure going into our upcoming school year. Um, so challenges, again, we have our persistent achievement gaps. I mean, we're comparing students without, with disabilities to students without. Um, providing the appropriate um, professional development and supports for general and special education teachers who are new or nervous about inclusive practices has been a challenge um, because we really run the gamut. We have folks who are full on um, and gung ho and enthusiastic about um, inclusion and co-teaching um, and some that you know, just want, want to learn more. Um, so just trying to get the right supports to the, at the right time for the right uh, folks. And then identification of and provision of prompt intervention for students at risk for chronic absenteeism and school avoidance was something that um, came to my attention this year. We're going to take a look at that. So this is Watertown attendance rates as compared to the state. Um, so we're a little bit behind the state um, for overall attendance. Um, average number of days absent is higher than the state. Um, absent 10 or more days, that's um, higher than the state. And chronically absent, um, also higher than the state. Unexcused absences more than nine, um, a bit higher than the state as well. 
So those are things that we think that we can do better. Um, what's that? Is it community outreach social media? Community, yes, <laughs> yes. Sorry. We're building, it's, it's coming. I know, I know. Is this for, are those numbers for all students or are those just for the students that are, that you've been under your jurisdiction? Yeah, excellent question. This is overall. This is the entire district. And the next slide will be kind of the folks that I tend to zero in on some more. So this is chronically absent students with disabilities. So this is percent of students with disabilities with 10 or more days absent, which is considered chronically absent. Um, and I do like the trend line, so we're orange, right? And we are, we're going down, um, and, but it's still alarming to me when I look at almost one-fifth of our students um, are, are absent more than 10 or more days, um, and that can really compound in terms of how their outcomes are going to be. Um, instructional assistance support has been um, something we've been talking about um, since even before I came on board. We had two separate reports that were um, handed to me when I crossed the threshold in Jan July of 2016. One was the EDCO report and one was the RSM report, um, both of which said we needed to really take a close look at our um, how we're using instructional assistance and whether it was really the best use. And um, So we've been paying a lot of attention to doing PD and looking at this. Um, we continue to have more instructional assistance um, than, than teaching um, staff under special education. Per regulations, the work of an instructional assistant has to be directly and overseen by a licensed professional. That happens very naturally when we are talking about our, our um, program. So say our, our um, connections program or our LB program, where you have the teacher is in that classroom most of the day with the students and with a group of instructional assistants. So that that oversight is very natural, and you see that, and, and we don't um, have any difficulty with that. It's more challenging to provide that appropriate oversight when, for instructional assistance in inclusive settings. These are some staffing trends um, in Watertown: teachers and paraprofessionals per 100 students with disabilities. Um, so on the left, we are looking at um, paraprofessionals. We call um, the, the group instructional assistants here in Watertown the state saying paraprofessionals. Um, so the dark red line is, I'm sorry, left is Watertown, right is state. Um, so the dark line is your teachers. Um, so we're at currently 8.7 um, teachers per student, with dis 100 students with disabilities, and 20.7 um, instructional assistants. Um, if you look at the state, um, there are five teachers per 100 students with disabilities and 10.9 paraprofessionals. So, so why? Um well, two things. One, I this this is 2017. Yes. That's data from the fall. Um, this data, I believe, was from the spring. Yeah. From the spring. Mm -hmm. I don't. It has. It like we, spring and tests. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it's Ethan's right. mm -hmm. submissions are probably spring. Yeah. But I, you know, in the past year, I thought actually the number of instructional systems has gone down. <coughs> um, it has it has reduced, but not not significantly. I I think that the if we were to do the math, and I can do that, that math for you, just not in my head this second, I think that you're going to find that we're maybe at like 18 for 100 students with disabilities. From the 20.7? Approximately, yes, because it was about 10% of a reduction, so I think uh -huh. that that's about where we're at. Yep. And so I guess just a general question of why, why we would be so much higher than yeah. the state. Right, and I, I don't have a, um, like a single answer to the why. I think that we um, have been examining that, that very question, and I think it's multifaceted. Um, we are working with the um, building principals to examine that. We have an instructional assistance summit. That we're going to um, have conversations and look at what the research has to say about use of instructional assistance, um, and really kind of getting at, you know, why that is, you know, what, what's happening in Watertown. That I mean, is our, our distribution, I, maybe it was back earlier, our, our distribution of students with disabilities, is, does it look significantly different than the state in terms of the nature of sure. it, does it? Not, not, not significantly like, compared to this. So we right. are a little bit on the high end for percentage. Um, we're at 20% students with disabilities, where the state is 17%. Right. Um, but that doesn't account for Kind of the picture that we're so looking. even even within that twenty percent, I guess the question too is the nature of the the students. Is it um, you know more, more <coughs> students that are sep that are substantially separate than is typical at the state level? I mean those kinds of measures. Yeah. So I mean, I mean 
No, and I think, and again, I can share research with you that talks about um, when we start to try and say, well, maybe it's the nature of the student, um, when you really kind of dig down at things, usually it's more about the adults. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's really about what adults believe. Yeah, well, Dee, Dee please. So, so I think that, that one thing that, that, that we haven't really gone over, and I, I think that there's a place to talk about, actually, um, Karen Heaney mentioned a little bit about the GET process and you know, interventions, et cetera. And I think that, that when you hear inclusion, and you hear inclusive practices, oftentimes people associate, um, well, you're gonna move a, a student into a classroom and you're gonna include them with, with instructional assistance. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's not what inclusion means. Inclusion means it could run the gamut. You could include somebody and they need accommodations and the accommodations should be delivered by the teacher. Or maybe they do need some additional support with a co-teacher or an, an, an instructional assistant. I think that my, my personal feeling, just based on the time that I've had here, is that when we started to include more people in classrooms, we included more IAs as well. Um, but that's not necessarily what inclusion means. And I think right. that when we, one of the goals, the priorities in a, in a goal is, is exploring the multi-tiered systems of support. Um, we don't necessarily have a fully developed RTI process here. And I think that when we do that, we'll, we'll be able to work with everybody about, you know, how do we intervene on, on students' behalf? And it's it's not always with an additional person. It might be interventions or accommodations. So I. I I think it's part of it, mm -hmm. if I had to. So I personally, I think the IAs are extremely important. Um, I understand that this graph shows that there's too many, but on a day-to-day -day basis, and how I think that they should be with the children, they are the backbone in the classrooms, these kids with severe special needs and limited special needs. They're more than transporting the kids from one classroom to the other. When the kids are having meltdowns, when they can't pay attention, when they're disrupting the class, the IAs can help that so the teacher can continue to teach the class without pulling away. I mean, I think they're extremely, extremely important. I know you said the adults maybe think mm -hmm. more, but so the, I'm personally for keeping more IAs. So the, there will always be need for instructional assistance within yes. special education. There's, absolutely. there's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and I echo what you're saying is that they're absolutely the backbone of a special education program, and particularly um, when we have classrooms of students with severe special needs. Um, so that's that's not going away, that's not changing. And in fact, when we have talked about, you know, when we had our 10% reduction, you know, last year when we looked at that, um, that's not where we looked at. It, it, we, we looked at classrooms, that, you know, and, and, and even this year we're looking at classrooms where there is an instructional assistant assigned and there isn't a student with, with special needs in that classroom. So maybe just redirecting those IAs into a classroom that does need them. Or a school, yeah. Correct, yes, okay. yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah, the, none of this is to say that the work of instructional assistance is not yeah. important. Or that it it's is, not needed. Uh, there will never go away. It's extremely important, and we're investing very heavily in appropriate professional development for mm -hmm. the, the um, teachers that work with instructional assistants as well as instructional assistants. That's vital. Kathy, I have a question just following up on that, which is, you know, you're talking about going towards more co-teaching and talk about how there's some adults who maybe are or more resistant to that, but mm -hmm. then you have this group of adults um, who are IAs who are already obviously co-teaching in many ways just by being in classrooms. Is the district looking at maybe having a pathway for some of those IAs to go back to school or have some training so that they can actually gain a license and perhaps become full co-teachers? So we have um, hired so many IAs already, so that, they're, that those pathways already exist. Okay. Um, so I can but if they wanted to become like a full special educated a licensed teacher, are, are there, is there a pathway that the district is perhaps partnering with the university or something along those lines to maybe? I don't know that we have a particular partnership with the universities, but we do have many instances where um, IAs, our IAs, have gone to get their licensure and we have then hired them. Okay. Um, many. And, and we have also many IAs that actually have teaching licenses. Yeah. Right. So well, yeah, we're <laughs> moving towards towards the full right. co-teaching model, though, right. is that opportunity going to be given if we're going right. to? We strongly encourage every one of our instructional assistants to go into special education. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am constantly um, hiring. It's, it's, a, it's one of those fields where we will always have a job. So I, we absolutely encourage that. Okay. Um, Kathy, can I ask a quick question about these? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like the the pitch and the difference between um, professionals and teachers for, for Watertown is, is really dramatic, but I also, um, I mean, but all of the numbers in Watertown are generally higher than state average. Is that kind of similar to, like, a testament to the kind of staff that we keep on hand in terms of, like, ratios and how many, kind of, like, in class size compared to, like, almost kind of like our 
good counseling ratios? I'm just curious. I mean, the numbers are just generically much higher anyways. Right. Um, so I think that it's, like, it's hard to just say proportionately. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I know that we value small class sizes for right. general education. Um, and so I'm trying to recalibrate my thinking about what's an appropriate caseload for a special educator, mm -hmm. just so you have an understanding to, um, you know, what most colleges are telling their graduates that have gone into special education, expect a caseload of about 20 if you're working in inclusion. And for st substantially separate, usually it's eight to 12. Those are your caseloads, where our caseloads um, are at the elementary level, so just the ratios, it doesn't mean this is the exact caseload, but one to seven um, for elementary, and then um, for our um, high school and middle school, one to 10, one to 11 students. So that's why this, that, that's why this chart looks like that. For the teachers, yes. That's why we have more the teachers. teachers. That's the teachers. Yeah. teachers. It's yeah. yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, that's a very low case. Yes, right. those are the very low case. The, the pitches, that's not there. No, no, not the pitch. Yeah. I'm saying the numbers are higher. The numbers okay. are bigger because the case loads are different than what. Yeah, we have lower case loads, case which, you know, it's an inverse relationship. Yes. Got yeah. it. We have fewer students. We need more staff, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, All right, thank you. I mean, I, I just come back to, I mean, I, I absolutely we need to provide the best education we can and the best services possible. But, I mean, these are, are really high numbers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but you know, we this district has had this issue for years. I mean, decades practically. I mean, <laughs> really, it goes back. I mean, Tom and I were on a task force probably 15 years ago to look at this issue. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I think it's we have very high special education costs, mm -hmm. and I, I I get that, and I think we have great services, but I think we just need to, um, uh, you know try to make sure we look at this and understand is, is this the kind of thing, is this, you know, are these costs merited and are we providing, you know, the kinds of services we need and with, within the kind of, you know, fiscal constraints that we have. So, I, mean, I just think we ought to keep looking at this. Mm -hmm. encouraged to. So, on that note, we have to Sorry. recommending some additional staff. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't the right weed you were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. We're going to start with um, the, <laughs> the full-time community, out, um, community outreach social worker. Um, and this is a position to address the needs of our most at-risk students, so those experiencing homelessness, chronically absent, DCF, and Elkhorn involved. As Didi talked about, this is a district-level position, so um, you know, to your point, it will um, assist with at the level, and it's going to help us really monitor attendance in a, yes. uh, a systematic way across the district um, and reach those students early. Because when we, I, I tend to see these attendance issues when we've had school refusal that's been going on for months, um, and it's at the high school, and it is so entrenched, it's really difficult to reverse that pattern. Um, but when we start to look back in those records, we start to see this, the, the warning signs when students are, you know, in kindergarten, first grade. You know, they're, they're, they're tardy, they're absent, and it's really, it starts to build up to this. So we're going to um, get some systems in place um, and really be flagging those things. Do you want to add to that at all? No, I, I just think your slide about our attendance um, kind of speaks volumes to this, this need that we have. Um, and I, I just think that there, that's that, that link between the home and the school that yes, our, our guidance counselors work really hard and they make lots of connections with the home, but this person, you know, on top of everything else they're doing, this is that person's sole responsibility. And I, I think that builds, you know, we, we have a similar person on the town site as well. Um, and I think that you find that they're they're better at getting to the root causes of mm -hmm. some of the issues that we have. Um, so I I think it's a great add to the district. Is that, this is K to 12? Yep, yes, yeah, let's see how it goes. <laughs> But one, one is better than that. <coughs> so I'm just wondering if it's... Yeah. So would they collaborate with the guidance counselors yes. in yep. the building? Yeah, all like on a weekly basis, they'll go in, they'll, they generally will meet, you know, for like a half hour with the principal, the guidance counselors, they'll just look at who, who's of concern, kind of run through a ten, they'll do attendance lists mm -hmm. and see who's, who should they go talk to. Um, you know, when people get that, we know that after five absences, you get a, you know, a letter that tells you, but it's once you hit 10, that means you have interventions. Um, so this person will really help with those interventions. So it's, yes, we'll right with guidance. Families as well. The They'll work with the yeah, families. Yeah, that's that, that's it. That's their. So when you have that list and you say, you know, you know, the Smiths, you know, uh, the Smith children aren't coming to, to school, they'll go out and work with the the Smith family to figure out how to best support them to get the kids to school. But they also um, have a relationship with the police mm -hmm. and with yes. kind of other people in town that 
could provide services. So if there is like, an issue of homelessness or food yes. insecurity, yep. that they'll know where to go to get those supports. Yep. Right. Yes. Um, we're looking for a um, special education teacher to increase inclusive practices at the Cunniff. Um, the same for the Watertown High School. I think for the Cunniff, and um, Nina may speak to this more in her slide, but I think that that's so that we have um, co-teaching available at each grade level. Um, Watertown High School to kind of expand um, the, the opportunities. The Watertown, the high school is a little bit difficult because you're kind of on roller skates. There's, uh, there's so many different um, classes to, to kind of cover. Um, and then we're looking at a 0.4 increase of adjustment counselor role at the high school. Um, currently we have um, essentially 1.2 MTEs, <coughs> and that's, that's made up of um, two counselors who are each 0.6. Um, and we're bringing um, that one of the point sixes up to uh, full time. Um, and then we're looking to bring in house some services that are currently being um, provided through a contract, um, so contracted out. And those are visually teacher, teacher the visually impaired and orientation mobility specialist. Um, we would get more service if you were able to hire someone for essentially two days per week um, for less money. So we're hoping to be able to post for that and bring those services in house for our students. Um, we um, actually had a vacancy that took place this year. Um, when we had a resignation of a, um, a CODA um, out of our OT department, and we uh, we hired a full-time occupational therapist. Um, and the reasoning there is that that rounds out their numbers to four throughout the district, and they're able to um, provide the evaluations for the students, um, consultation, and, and direct services. So they can do all of those um, functions. Um, and we're adding, looking to add a half-time teacher, one, a 0.5 FTE, um, and that's so that we would have one additional full-day integrated program option for our families, um, and an assist, instructional assistant to support that program, for that classroom. And at early steps, also 0.2 FTE, administrative assistant, and that would ensure full-time support um, for Karen and the teachers and children in early steps. Um, so some budget offsets. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Do we already have a one full day program? We do have one full day program. Um, however, the need for looking for longer care, um, both at the pre-K level and also at the preschool level, has <coughs> excuse me has increased. Um, and also the needs of some of our special ed students that do require a longer day, but do not um, qualify for a sub separate program. So it provides us with more opportunities to support the children. Um, Amy, there's currently one one of the classrooms that is just in the morning, and the classroom is empty in the afternoon. So, so just round that out. This would be rounded up. Yeah. Okay. And the same, it's not. Uh, it's adding on the additional para time or the IA time, so to support that class. Mm -hmm. To support that classroom. Okay. So you have right now two, two. zero point fives. Yes. So. Um, and then um, a half-time early steps ESL teacher. We looked at align aligning scheduling and staffing um, to meet the student needs um, and saw that that was no longer needed. Um, we already talked about um, the code of resignation. Um, and then over, overall in the district, we're looking at 5.4 FT instructional assistance um, as where students are increasingly supported by special education teachers and inclusive models. The, uh, we have a half-time guidance counselor at the Lowell, um, and we talked about this earlier, that we're looking at the administrative functions that are currently assigned to the guidance counselor, the MCAS oversight, class assignments, and, and things of that nature, would be reassigned to the new assistant principal position that was um, talked about, um, allowing the, the remaining full-time guidance counselor at the Lowell to dedicate 80% or more of their workday to direct services, as is re the recommendation of the American School Counselors Association. Um, and Lowell also will be supported by the new community outreach social worker. Um, we're looking to eliminate a half-time special education teacher at the Hosmer, that position. Um, when we looked through um, what was the student's needs were, we, that was no longer needed. We still have that low ratio of um, one teacher for every stu seven students with disabilities. Um, and we're also able to have an additional co-teaching model in grade two at the Hosmer. So, any questions on those? I just have a quick question. So yes. the, the 5.4 full-time instructional assistance, um, is that 
at one building or is that district wide? Um, so it's not, it was two buildings. Um, so I think that it was three at the Cunniff and 2.4 at the um, Watertown High School. Um, I believe at least at the high school, um, these are positions, at least one of which that is already with somebody who left during the school year. Um, and what our hope is and what our, my experience has been and our experience has been is that um, those we are likely to lose through attrition. Um, as, it, as I said, a lot of our IEs are going back to school to become teachers, so they're moving on to, to teaching positions. And, and just to echo what you said earlier, um, that we're going to work with the principals and look at the district-wide look at IAs, mm -hmm. and just to determine, um, you know, based upon student need. I mean, just just because we propose that it might be a cut of three at the cut of, um, if we end up that we have a, a different need, then we would meet the need. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think that we need to be pigeonholed into it's got to be from these two locations. Mm -hmm. um, we might find that. You know, people move in, people move out, and the requirement might shift between the buildings. So that's why we have to have that big district look at what we need um, to make sure that we're we're covering the um, all the the students' needs across the district. If that makes sense. So I'm just going to um, do a quick overview where we're at with our out of district tuition. Um, we have 54 students currently served out of and out of district placements. The total um, tuition we're projecting to have spent by June 30th um, is $4,768,355. Um, if you take a just a straight average, um, that's $88,303 per student that is outplaced. Um, and the range um, of actual costs for students, um, the, uh, the low end is $33,941, um, and the higher end is $255,580. This, this doesn't include Minuteman? That does not include no, the right. Your Yes, your projected tuition amount would include the 4,500 share right. the different the different 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 tuition, the difference. So, Minuteman now The 54 charges, students doesn't include no, the Minuteman. No, no. Oh, the number doesn't, but no. the tuition amount. But the, but the tuition would include the special education piece, yeah, mm -hmm. piece of the Minuteman tuition. Correct. I don't know the fifth students do, but. Students do not. No, there's 33. Yeah. Students, 33 there's currently 33 yeah. students with special needs at Minuteman. Yeah, right. 61 altogether. 33 with special needs. Right. Good questions. Thanks. Um, special education transportation, we use um, the Lab, and that reduces costs depending on ridership. Um, in January, as of January, 49 riders um, were riding um, in places as close as Watertown. We have day schools here. Um, and as far away as Boxborough and Chelmsford, average cost per day per rider, $88.54. Um, the range, $48 to $213 in rounding. Um, and average in-district cost is about $25. Total number of students riding in-district is 79. And all but 12 of the total 128 students are on, sh on shared vehicles. There are some times where if you only have one student from a, a region that's going to one particular city school, they end up riding alone, and that's that, that is expensive. Sometimes because of a student's need, um, they actually have to um, ride a bus alone as well. Um, so that can happen. Um, and then the total anticipated cost, um, $1,242,422. Sorry, and then all the numbers. We'll say the lab, the lab collaborative just recently rebid their um, transportation this past spring, and the rates they uh, quotes they received were very favorable. It will require you know, changing some providers, but in many cases the out of district routes, the transportation rates actually went down slightly, which is kind of unheard of in this market. In district rates went up slightly. Uh, that's just the rates. Uh, this is such a high. You have to have an incredible appreciation for the work that, that folks in Kathy's office do, especially Nick, yeah. and trying to make sure that um, you know, we have as many kids on as, as appropriate on a vehicle as possible mm -hmm. um, because it's the sharing of the transportation that really helps us to manage this budget, and there's oftentimes great variability for that for that very reason. So, um, but. What, that's the good news is we don't often hear good news when it comes to transportation, but on this particular one, the rates are favorable for us for next year. Anyway. Does the same thing um, for the um, 
Well? No, the Minuteman students, um, the bulk of the tuition for the Minuteman students is charged for the regular day budget, which you'll see at the end of the presentation tomorrow, uh, as is the, uh, so the tuition and the transportation are included as part of that. Yes. Yes. Those students, those 61 students basically are assessed a, a rate of 16894 I think is the tuition that's the regular day share, and then for those that are receiving special education students, there's an additional 4,500. Transportation cost for, for those students is also under the regular day budget. Okay. Anything of note there? Mm -hmm. Oh, it goes on and on. <laughs> <laughs> This piece is just, if you want to go back to this, I think this, the first few tables you saw was the entire district, so all the locations uh, in the district, including the, the district-wide. This is just the district-wide budget, so I think it's worthy of note that um, through some, some, pretty, some pretty favorable numbers here that our special education budget overall is actually going down. Um, granted, it's it's two tenths of a percent, but two tenths of a percent is two tenths of a percent. It's the right direction. So, a lot of work to um, bring students back from the district, bring the services here into the district. And I think that's clearly paying off in the district wide budget. I think the way that you framed it is important because it's not that you're reducing services to students; you're increasing services in district, which is less. I think we had 71 kids out of district place. I know that changes depending on, but 54 kids out of district. Yeah, we, we brought that three in the past year, um, and none of that had anything to do with me. It was really the parents and the schools um, that did that work. Um, and that's really pleasing to see. I think that's what you want the parents to want their students to be here and for us to be able to have the capacity to welcome them back. That's great. This slide says elementary and secondary schools, but we're obviously just doing elementary. All right, so next on the agenda is elementary schools. They have the clicker, which is great, so they're going to click once. Fabulous. Um, you know, I think one of the things, I don't know if you want to talk about them, we're like ships passing in the night. Um, but I, I think that, so when we when we think about elementary, obviously one of the, the major priorities that we've stated is um, maintaining the class size um, within the guidelines um, as much as possible. We know that we um, are, we, we try to maintain them as close as possible, but sometimes there might be a slight deviation. Um, but one of the things that we always try to consider are the enrollment projections. And um, we've had enrollment projections done by NESDEC and um, Decision Insight. And what we're seeing basically is, you know, sure, it's a little bit of a growth, but nothing dramatic. Um, so we have to be responsive to it, but it's not, we're not seeing something <coughs> in the next year or two, meaning 2019, even, you know, 2020 is a little bit of a spike um, at the Hosmer. but. You know, in general, the numbers are staying fairly constant, um, which will help us as we move forward to ensure that we have appropriate staffing within our buildings. Um, Quick, <laughs> are those were those numbers um, not considering a redistribution of the kids in the new elementary? Yes, buildings? exactly. Yes. Yeah. So okay. if you if, if you click right, um, so we have not at all accounted for that. Um, you will notice that probably in twenty twenty one. Um, you know, if we open up our new buildings in 2021, then yes, there would be a difference. Um, we were looking at, for those of us out there who are mostly aware, but might not be fully aware, um, that when we, we renovate or reconstruct or build um, our, our elementary schools, um, one of the, the goals is to um, sort of bring the size, the enrollment between the Hosmer and the Lowell to be very close um, in terms of the numbers of classrooms and the numbers of students. Um, but within both of those buildings that our goal is to also have some flexibility if there's changes in, in population. But yes, 
um, come 2021 that those Hosmer orange numbers will go down and the Lowell numbers will go up and they'll seem to be pretty much on par, um, give or take you know, 15, 20 students. But that is, that is something that is not accounted in here. And until we actually determine what the building's gonna be like, we won't account for that at this point in time. Um, but that will, I mean, I think it wasn't really to your point, but I think what you're also um, speaking of is, is the reason that we're doing that is so that we're able, you know, the kind of the kind of will always remain smaller than the Lowell and the Hosburn, but by by bringing those two buildings together, it helps us to be more responsive to changes in in um, the numbers of students that we have. So that's one of the reasons that, that we're going to do that. Um, when you only have a certain amount of classrooms, small amounts of people will cause um, overcrowding issues. So the more that we can add in terms of classrooms, the better we are at being able to respond to changes in, in, in moment. So that's that's the reason for that. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Click. So one of the things that when we talk about class size um, and you know making sure that we are within those guidelines, uh, both Mary and I have looked at um, the FY18 numbers in terms of the the average class sizes, the numbers of students that are in the classrooms. Just going to explain like the first column on the left is FY18. So that's the number of students, um, the number of classrooms, and then the average class sizes that we have in there. Um, you know, there was one outlier at the Lowell this year. We worked really hard to ensure that um, within those, that 24 that we had um, co-taught classrooms um, and that we had support so that the, the students were able to, or the teachers were able to have um, additional support within there. So I think we did pretty well with that larger class size, um, but we know that, that was um, one of the bigger ones. But one of, the, one of the things that we look at when we look at enrollment is are there areas that we have a need to increase, but likewise, are there areas that potentially we can decrease? Um, this is something that, you know, districts every year do this. Um, because just because we know that, say for example, we need to go up a classroom at the Hosmer in grade two, um, is there potentially another area that we might be able to go down a classroom? And that is exactly what happened. So um, what we're looking at in the middle column here um, is, the redistribution of um, in the Hosmer, you'll see a green five, and then you'll see a Lowell uh, red three, and basically that is because we're adding a classroom at the Hosmer, but we're reducing a classroom at the um, Lowell. And one of the questions, and I know that this will come up, and, and when we get into this conversation a little bit further, um, you know, there was a, there was a request, and I, I totally understand why um, the Lowell, I'm sorry, the Hosmer requested two two grade two teachers, which would increase that to six. Um, but when we look down at the very bottom, which is the average class size, sorry, I'm going to hit you, Mary, I can feel it. Um, okay. But you see down there, just I'm giving you the warning. Um, you'll see that in grade two, across the board in all three buildings, the, the, the class sizes are relatively the same. So we're, we're in the guideline, which is 22. We're slightly over at the Hosmer, but once again, um, within those five classrooms, um, we are moving to having a co-taught classroom in the grade two. So we would ensure that if one of those classrooms has um, 23, that there would be an additional adult in there to support the students that are in the classroom. So the, the ratio is actually, and I, I'm a parent of a student who was in a co-taught classroom, um, so we ended up having one adult for every 12 kids. And you know, honestly, that's fantastic. So I think even though there's a slight increase there, the, the decision was made for equity across the buildings um, and to allow for that, um, that redistribution that would keep us in a place where we could add many of the things that we have on that list of priorities um, for the district. So that's just a, a, a preview of why it is that we went with the one instead of the two. Um, Do you want to take questions on that now or later when we talk about the hospital? Uh, I don't, I did, I'm, it, it, now it's fine. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just wondering, how, do you know how many of those classrooms in the second grade will be 23 versus 21 or 22? So I, um, I don't know exactly. I mean, the, the Hosmer principal will be working through that. Um, you know, I think you would have, based on that, probably three classes of 23 and two of 22, but you might have, you know, one class, four, I don't know. I mean, it's, I can't tell you exactly how many classrooms are gonna have how many students, and then also based on needs. Um, you know, if you have one of those classrooms that doesn't have a co-taught situation, you might have a lower class size. Um, but if you have one that does have that co-taught situation, you might have the larger class size. So I think that I can't tell you right now how many they're gonna be. Um, Bob, do you have a, a sense at this point? Or? Uh, 22 and 23 right now are the class sizes. Oh, well, yeah, we've kind of created a, a rough draft of our uh, assignments for next year. 
do you remember, for, I mean, and I'm not putting Bob on the slide, because this is a very fluid process. We have not set classes, like, so don't think that in any way, shape, or form. But in that grade two, um, between the one class that will potentially be co-taught, do you know how many might actually have, um, like, an instructional assistant in it? Um, there's uh, one instructional assistant for the grade level, so when the teacher in the co-taught classroom uh, is there, the instructional assistant is in another classroom with about three students that have IEPs, but we also have support from the ESL teacher, um, our reading teachers, and our tutors. Right. So they'll, they'll, there'll be a lot of adults to support the students um, in those classrooms. Um, so that's kind of the, I mean, one of the points that we would make as well. So that's... Yeah, my concern is that these kids, which is awesome, this year and last year have had like 18 and 19 kids in the class, their class in first grade and second, and in kindergarten and first grade. Mm -hmm. And that's been really awesome, and it's something I tell people about all the time that I love about Watertown. Even when you compare it to Belmont, those our numbers are lower in class size, and I think that's great. So my concern is for these, this grade of kids, which my child is in, going from the smaller, the 18, 19, to 22, 23, that's a big difference, I think, in second grade. And, um, I was just, I wanted to hear more about the decision to do the five versus the six. Right. So, so I think that in, in I mean, it, to, there's a reason why the guidelines are as they are. I mean, there's a reason why they, they gradually increase. So you go from, you know, 20 for K and one, 22 for two and three, and then 24 for four and five. And that is, that is because the nature of a kindergartner and the nature of a first grader, honestly, are the, the needs are such that you want to have lower class sizes. There are emerging readers, um, you know, there are emerging, you know, mathematicians. Um, having that, that ability to have that smaller classes in those, those two grade levels is, is really important. Um, but you'll see it's always been, you know, when we hit grade two, when things, and Allison over there, I'm not going to put her on the spot, but we know that grade one is the, the, like this crucial year for reading where you started the year and kids are everywhere. And then as they get through grade one, towards the end, they start to get a little closer together. That doesn't mean they're all together. But grade two, you're not going to find as much of a disparate, um, say, for example, literacy instruction. So um, it's, an, it's, an, it's not just Watertown. The, the guidelines are like this kind of in elementary, that as they get a little older, you can anticipate having larger class sizes because they become a little bit more homogeneous in terms of their learning and, and, and you start shifting more to content and less about really building that literacy and numeracy. So um, I hear what you're saying, but there is always going to be a, a, a point in all of the schools where you go from that nice smaller K1 into a little bit of a larger 2-3. And then even in, in 4-5, you start to get into the maybe you know, 23, 24. Um, you know, we actually are pretty fortunate. Um, we're not across the board like that. I mean, our class sizes are pretty small, um, even in the, the, the upper grades. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the reason why, is because the nature of the learner is definitely changing as they enter into second grade. And the, uh, speaking about the Cosmer specifically, if we get new kids registering over the summer that are coming into grade mm -hmm. one that are in the Hosmer catchment area, um, Will they be? Will you be looking at putting them at, the, at other schools to avoid getting yep. up to like 24? And yeah, one of the the, the Watertown has an, a, a very favorable policy for um, because of the fact that we only have three schools and we only have a certain number of classrooms. That if you're a new move-in and in that one particular class and in that one particular school that you can't, there's not room in that that in. Then yes, we would. We've done that. We've asked to have those students be at a different school. Um, it's not the best situation, but given the fact, again, that we only have three schools, um, that is what we have been asked to do. So would you consider the 22, 23, the final cut, or would you be going higher if you had more kids coming in? I think we would try to maintain that as much as possible. And, and honestly, truth be told, and, and we, we kind of talked about this last year at the Lowell, because as you see in grade three last year, we had 24, which was two above. Um, you know, we monitored that very closely, and we had a discussion about, you know, should we add, we honestly, should we add another classroom? So we got to a point, because you see that our, our numbers are 22 in the other two schools, so it's not exactly like we have a, an abundance of space. So, you know, it was about July last year that we made a, a, a decision, and it was close, whether we should add another classroom, which would, you know, we'd have to think about it financially, how we would get that done, but we would have figured it out, because it would have had to have happened. Or could we look at staff and 
make sure that we had instructional assistant support in the classrooms or have a co-taught classroom um, to mitigate the numbers. And, you know, I mean, sure, the class sizes are large at the Lowell, and yeah, it wouldn't have been great if they were 22, but I think the students have fared very well um, with those sizes. So ideally, we wouldn't go much higher, and if we had to go, if there was like a six kids all moved into grade two, then we'd have a conversation about do we need to add another classroom? Um, you know, you run into other issues when you do that too, which is like space. Like right, you gotta make sure you have right. to put them. And, um, <laughs> this is why in 2021, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we, we will have literally classrooms that will be utilized hopefully for um, science, science or FLES or, you know, areas that, yeah, maybe, but the point was like, yay. Um, but the point would be that <laughs> if we needed to move because all of a sudden we had a year that was a bubble year, that we'd be able to take that classroom um, and, you know, and have that as a classroom. Right now we don't have that built into these buildings. So when we have to add a classroom, it becomes very challenging. Um, Mina can certainly speak to that. <laughs> She's mm -hmm. faced that many times in the Lowell as well, you know, having to move people around. And it's, it's not going to stop us, but it's just another thing. Like if the decision at the Lowell, when we had, a, we had an issue with it, we couldn't, there was not really a classroom to put them in. So that was the other point. When you get to 24, is it how are we going to do it, and can we do it better with, with supporting the, the teacher with additional supports, or you know figuring out displacing other people to make that classroom work? So, a lot of a lot of things go into that, and we will always be assessing that up until the very end. Um, and we are certainly open if we needed to to add another teacher if there was a big move in. Can I ask it just in addition to that point? Um, I know, I know um, Bobby, you were a very thoughtful approach toward placements in <coughs> each classroom, kind of thinking strategically about, you know, kids who have, you know, ESL kids mm -hmm. or, and, you know, ES, English language learners and, and so kind of grouping needs together. So that is also another way, and I'm not going to speak for you, but I know that's the way that mm -hmm. we've talked about yep. providing additional adult support in classrooms that are a little bit larger so that because I mean, it's the teaching and learning that matters. It's the content that we care about in terms of as a parent, and making sure that it's an environment where there's enough attention that your child is getting the kind of you know content that is appropriate. So, do you want to just talk a little bit about your process for that? Sure. Cut off. We'll go next. Oh wait. I said, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. So we started our process with placement by um, being more efficient with the use of. Uh, our staff, um, the co-teaching was a big deal. We started that in 2013 with fifth grade, and we got it down to grade three last year. We're going to add grade two. So we look at the, the students' needs, and we looked at the number of IAs that are required. We grouped shared IAs together, which the, Watertown has had a history of, <coughs> of not being efficient with a lot of the things we do. We would say the child needs a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-two, a one-to-three, when in fact they need an adult, another adult support in the classroom. So we changed the wording on IEPs, we provided the right people, so we're able to group the students with their needs and with the support that they need, and it's a, a much more efficient way to do it, and um, saves on staff, it helps the children, and it makes placement more uh, successful. So I'm gonna add just one, one other thing, and, and I, I, I'm, <coughs> I'm just figure out how best to say this. Um, so you know that we've added the math coach and we're gonna um, fund the, another literacy coach, um, say for example. And um, there's one, one thing, uh, you make decisions, and you know, we, made, we made some priority decisions about what we wanted to fund. Um, and it's, I think that there's a point to say, if this year we have 23 students at the Hosmer in a classroom, and we actually have a math coach who's gonna be able to support that te all the teachers in terms of increasing their ability to deliver math instruction, um, I, I would rather have that, honestly, and I know this as a second grade parent, this probably doesn't sound great, um, than not have that support at all and have that teacher for 180 days not getting that in-depth instruction and support for math. So I think that we made those decisions about how are we going to move forward with um, improving our instructional practice, um, and, you know, I'm, and that was one of those hard conversations that we had, um, and, and that's, I think, where we ended up with the, the five instead of the six because we were able to add a math coach and a literacy coach as well. So, um, so that's, that's another reason. And I just wanted to make a, a point that this grade, particularly in Hosmer, I haven't looked at the detailed numbers that they come up in the low, but um, <coughs> it's higher than, uh, if it continues to be higher in future years, then um, 
you know, if if 113 kids go from first grade to second grade and then the following year to third grade and fourth grade and you mm -hmm. don't see a drop, um, I saw there were pers you know projections for slight drops maybe down to 98 mm -hmm. or something like that at the Hosmer. Um, this this grade and the grade or two underneath them that are expected to be at this higher end, it's just something I think to think about if, if there's this bubble of these grades, and I don't know if that will pass, that will stop and it'll drop back down. Um, hopefully the new buildings and the, um, and the, and the, you know, the leveling off of the size of the lull and the um, <coughs> will help that, but it's just, I think it's something to keep an eye on for this grade as they go forward. Yes, yeah, whenever we have bubble classes, I mean, I'm not, you know, when you look in, in general, the, the grade twos, we have actually bigger, <coughs> bigger bubbles coming. So I think that, you know, you, you absolutely you have to make sure that, um, that it could follow, a, I mean, we had a bubble back from, I think it was, the, what are they now? Um, sophomore? Ninth grade, right, sorry. <laughs> so it was somewhere in the, the but as, like there's always kind of like, you have to watch them along the way, all the way through middle school and all the way as they even enter to high school to make sure that you're anticipating having enough staff to cover them. Um, I, I actually, you know, looking at the numbers, I think that, that there might be other bubbles that were also being considered um, as they move through. But yes, you do have to pay attention to that and make sure that they don't always end up in the larger classes all the way through their 12 years of yeah. academia. And I do, I do just want to just say that I appreciate, again, the small class sizes and yep. the commitment that Watertown has. I think it's been really important. And um, I also, appreciate the integration that um, you guys were talking about and, and stuff like that that makes it such a great, the classroom experience great. And my daughter's had some great, um, I don't know what the terms are, but instructional aids the last two years or whoever that second adults and the adults that are coming <coughs> in, um, that's been the, the number of adults in the classroom um, at varying times or throughout the day, I appreciate it. So. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Okay, uh, click. Um, so I think I'll, I'll ha hand it over to Mina to talk about the kind of. Okay. All right, great. Okay, so the first slide up, it, it is up on the screen. Um, it's just a demographic overview of kind of, and you can see from that first area that um, the number of students at kind of has remained pretty much consistent. And this year we're really enjoying a healthy class size. I think. If you wander the school from grades pre-K to five, you'll see that pretty much teachers are comfortable with the number of students and we're managing this year very nicely. Um, we've even this year have been able to give back the music room, which last year we had to share with the art room. So that's a big plus for us because I feel like everyone has their own space and they're very comfortable <coughs> with navigating through the school year. So I'm happy to say that that has worked out quite nicely for us. Um, in terms of MCAS scores, I think Dr. McGinnis tonight and, and also um, Dr. Dalston have really set the scene for describing the wonderful things that are going on in Watertown in terms of supporting curriculum, but also supporting ways that we can improve our MCAS scores um, throughout the district. I know that um, our teachers are really focused on providing instruction that's going to be a match to student needs. We're trying to really keep students um, involved in the classroom so that they're really gaining the instruction and the, the learning that they'll be able to apply in all settings, including, including <coughs> standardized testing. Okay, um, this next slide just shows um, enrollment projection, projections for kind of, and again, our increases seem pretty consistent, and I don't think we have any areas that we really need to worry about in the next few years. And again, we're looking forward to the renovation, which will accommodate all of the growing needs that we have at Conniff. Um, I did want to say that this year at Conniff, we are running um, three kindergartens, which we have not done in a long time. Um, we actually also have currently a full cohort of 18 pre-K students. Um, and in the past, we've always had to run a pre-KK, but this year we are currently running 18 um, students in pre-K, three kindergartens, three first grade class classrooms, and three third grade classrooms as well. Um, and so with the renovation, we will bring all of our class, all of our grade levels up to three classrooms in each grade. All right, so some of the accomplishments that we can talk about at Conniff are also district-wide accomplishments, because I think one of the things that I do want to reinforce is 
I'm really happy to say that the calibration that's going on in the district is wonderful as well. I know that makes me feel good as a principal because whenever I talk to my colleagues, Bob and Stacy, we're all pretty much doing the same thing and that's thanks to all of the programming and all the initiatives that really are cohesive and make sense in the district, not only for one school but for all of the elementary schools. And then we're also looking forward to the spiraling that will occur from elementary to middle and high school. So there's a really nice, healthy environment that um, is conducive to teaching and learning. And I think we all feel really proud about that. So just to reinforce one of the accomplishments this year um, that Conniff is enjoying is we introduced a co-teaching model in grades K to five where classroom teachers are partnering with either a reading specialist, an ELL teacher, or a special educator. And um, as a principal, I think that's the one, most wonderful thing that I'm seeing in our building. I see a lot of collaboration with teachers. I see um, teachers really teaming together and sharing their expertise and their skills. And as a result, students, students are really benefiting from that. Um, I usually take a walk in the building during core instructional time, during the um, core reading blocks and <coughs> mathematics blocks, and I see a lot of um, thinking aloud with teachers where you can tell that they've planned together and de they're delivering a lesson to students where they're <coughs> modeling to students some of the thinking that they'll be um, putting forth in terms of helping them master content and skills. So a lot of that is really wonderful to see. Um, additionally, we've moved to a standards-based instructional model in grades K to five, and a lot of that is credited to all of the curriculum coordinators who have really put a lot of practices in place, brought in a lot of new curricular initiatives, and also some professional development that really has aligned the curriculum so that teachers really understand what they're teaching and they see the progression from one skill to the next. And again, it's a win-win for students because I think the mastery is a little more seamless when they really see the connections from one skill to the next skill. Um, we also this evening talked about the Teaching and Learning Alliance. And at Conniff, we have three teachers and two reading specialists that are participating in that training. And again, they're collaborating with their colleagues at that grade level and sharing some of the skills and expertise that they're taking on as well. So it's not only three teachers and two reading specialists, but some of that is infused throughout the school and some of the literacy practices that are taking place during reader's workshops. So that's a wonderful um, initiative as well. Um, I know Elizabeth talked earlier about introducing math teacher leaders in grades K to five. And again, that's another experience where these teacher leaders are really taking on some of the professional development that occurs as a district and also infusing that in our school at Conniff. And again, you know, it's something that starts district-wide and then transfers to the school, but we're all doing the same thing in all three schools, so it's a wonderful opportunity for everybody. Um, inter we've introduced Spanish at the grade one level, thanks to Adam, um, and that's a wonderful experience as well. I know our Spanish <coughs> teacher at Conniff is outstanding, and the kids in kindergarten and first grade it's amazing to see some of the Spanish instruction that they, that some of the knowledge that they've taken on and some of the conversations that, that's taking place with very young children in our school. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so in the, on the first bullet, the co-teaching model, so do you have co-teaching with, in like, in all those grades mm -hmm. for, and do you have, are some of them ELL teachers and, and is that like yes. a, is that? So last spring when we started to talk about co-teaching, and again, you know, I know through a lot of district discussions with Kathy Damaris, she was really reinforcing the importance of co-teaching, and I really always believed in that as a teacher, um, not just as a principal. When I, when I was a classroom teacher, I always believed strongly that if you collaborated with somebody, it would be a richer experience for your students. So at kind of what we did last spring is we had a lot of great <coughs> team meetings, and I really had the support of my team chair, and we really looked at you know, the number of students on IEPs in each grade level, the number of ELL learners in each grade level, and the number of students that needed tier two support for reading. And not that we put them in specific classrooms, but we tried to form some cohesive groups where kids had similar strategies that we could put together. We didn't really do anything to, you know, we wanted to keep the integrity of having a heterogeneous classroom. We didn't want to compose classrooms that had all special needs students or all ELL students or all kids that were tier two readers. So we kind of took some core groups and started to really move them around and form some grade level combinations so that we could put teams of teachers 
in each room that either supported tier two reading or ELL learners or the special education piece. And so this year, what, what we ended up doing is we have one class in one fourth grade that has, is a true co-top model where there is a special educator and a generalist together all day. And then the rest of our classrooms each have the support of either a reading specialist or a special educator <coughs> or an ELL teacher dur during the reading block for 90 minutes and also during the math block. And possibly some classrooms have it during the writing block as well. Um, and so that's what co-teaching looks like. It kind of everybody has at least 180 <coughs> minutes of co-taught, um, if not a little bit more, mm -hmm. based on the staffing that we have. Um, okay. So, I mean that, and that's sorry. I mean, that, sorry. just in general, like co-teaching doesn't have to be all day long. I mean, it's great if it can. I mean, sure, we have some places where right. it actually can be all day long. But it's, you know, sometimes a co-teacher is in two different, I mean, I mean just echoing what you said. Because right. I think sometimes you get lost in the fact that it has to be all day long. Um, but it's not always that way. Sometimes it is, which is great, right. but sometimes it isn't. So, no, that's great. It's interesting to hear. Um, is, is that, I'm, I'm sure, co-teaching and kind of what, whatever iteration you're using mm -hmm. looks different in all the schools. But I'm interested to know, is that kind of, that same strategy being used in all three schools? I, mean, I guess. To, I mean, I, I think that like there are some ESL, you know, co-taught blocks um, when, whenever possible. Um, the reading is a little unique in in Nina's building, but um, <coughs> you know, I, I think it just depends on which staff you have and how you can how you can group. And sometimes in a smaller building, it's a bit easier to do that. I mean, that's one of the joys of that. But um, you know, I think that we are looking at some further opportunities outside of even just the special education partnerships. Um, and might not even just be co-teaching. I mean, there might be some other ways to look at um, delivery of, of services. Um, okay, I might just, I just look, we, we, we looked at site council at the, 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 the trends at Hosmer in particular, and you know the special education numbers are going down and the ELL numbers are mm -hmm. going up. And looking at, you know, I have a kindergartner, second and fourth, and just looking at some of the classrooms, seeing the large numbers of kids who speak different languages coming, and just, it's just a really interesting model that you're using, and it sounds, especially for the language piece. Yeah. It's interesting because at the beginning I worried that teachers wouldn't get along, but really they've gotten along really well this year because I think they're sharing <coughs> expertise and they're seeing that they're benefiting from each other's support in the classroom. And you can imagine during a reading block of 90 minutes, if you have two adults in there, you really can see more than just the two or three groups that you would see by yourself. So it's kind of like a win-win for them. Yeah. Um, so it's wor I think it's working out really well. Great, thank you. So just a, a few additional accomplishments, maintained and regularly updated literacy and math grades. I know Elizabeth and um, Allison talked about that this year. And I think one of the things that I've seen improved at, at CUNIF is that since we have district-wide data grids now, the data gets in there in a timely manner and it's used in a timely manner, whereas before it would get in there and we would wait a while and then the results would kind of be outdated because you'd have new data that would need to be informing your instructions. So they're really putting the data in, looking at it, and informing their instruction with the results as well. Um, so good, good teaching and learning. And then we also implemented, because of the co-teaching that's going on in a variety of different ways, it kind of... Um, we also <coughs> had to add a co-planning period because one of the dilemmas we faced at the beginning of the year is if teachers are co-teaching, then they need time to plan. So what we do at Cunniff is we have a, an A through E day, a six-day schedule where I give them 20 minutes every other day during recess to, co to plan as a team. Um, and that has been helping them um, so that they really get a chance to collaborate with one another. And then we've also hosted an international fair, which we plan on doing again this year. Um, so goals that we'd like to support um, by the upcoming budget is to expand the co-teaching model in grade, grades K to 5 kind of to include co-teaching during literacy and math, um, to refine standard-based teaching practices, again as a district, continue to partner with the TLA, um, Teaching and Learning Alliance, and establish coaching partnerships in addition in additional grade levels, and those would be two and four, kind of, and possibly grade five, because it's been an outstanding experience for <coughs> teachers. And also, as we spoke about this evening, um, to include Spanish instruction in grade two ne next year and um, maintain Spanish instruction in grades K and one um, three times per week. 
Um, additionally, okay. to implement a social... I'm sorry, uh, just, sure. I, I, maybe I just got confused here sure. then. On the, back on the co-teaching, the first mm -hmm. bullet that you had there? Sure. So where are you co-teaching now if you're not doing literacy and math? Maybe I missed that. We so. are doing it in every grade level just to expand it a little bit more. There are some classrooms that only have it for 60 minutes. To expand it to 90 would be even better. So just to, oh, to expand. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. I mean, I, I read that to me to, to add it to, but you already have it there. You right. want to make it longer. Make it I'm longer. sorry. Um, again, to just implement the, the social emotional curriculum, I know I've been part of that team this year with Dr. McGinnis, and we're really looking forward to providing teachers with a, an additional resource that they will have so that they can support students with any um, social emotional learning that needs to take place in the classroom. Um, continue to refine best practices around the use of data to inform instruction. Refine the building-based schedule in order to create time for grade level teams to meet consistently in order to plan. I think that's an important piece that, as a school, we'd like to continue to focus on and continue to support before school programs such as the Reading Buddies program and Number Sense Power um, to provide tier two support as well. Okay, and um, kind of um, recommended budget additions and offsets. <coughs> Again, district wide, we're looking to continue to build our classroom libraries. Um, provide that support during independent reading so that um, students have rich materials to use during that time. Um, I'd like the additional ed special education teachers so that I can again increase my co-teaching model at Cuniff. Um, I'd like an, an additional 0.5 reading specialist to support um, tier two interventions as well in our school and um, the offset of that would be the instructional assistance. Um, and an additional um, ELL teacher based on projected number of ELL students that kind of with an increase. These are unfunded, unfunded budget requests and then a point to our teacher, which is also unfunded. Fourteen percent. What's the driver there? Many, many, many. A lot of this comes from the again pushing. Oh, shifting. Thank you. I got it. Okay. You told me like twelve times. I have to remember at some point. Yeah. Teachers. We <laughs> <laughs> get one more. Lucky <laughs> <laughs> number thirteen. 13. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm just going before we transition. Um, <laughs> I, I mentioned this before, um, that right now we are, and so did Teresa, uh, about uh, doing an, uh, an evaluation of our ESL programming. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, that was an ask here, and you're actually going to see a reduction at the Hosmer. Um, that's not that our numbers are going down. What that is is that we need to just look at how we're going to be scheduling um, ESL, and even Teresa's exciting what she saw today. I mean, there's so many ways to do it, but I think that, you know, staffing-wise, we just want to make sure that we're doing it correctly. And so we think that you know, not finding that one and potentially doing a reduction at the Hosmer is not going to jeopardize how it is that we deliver those services. It's just going to be a shift in terms of either grouping of kids or being more efficient or, you know, having a newcomer class. I mean, there's, there's, there's options that we're not necessarily doing right now that we believe that if we re-look at scheduling that we won't have that need for that additional staff at the kind of... And, so. then, and then we would, that would be implemented in FY19. Mm -hmm. the yep. Okay. Yep. I mean, I think, that, you know, to Bob's credit, he spent a lot of time this year, a lot of time, wrangling and wrestling with the, um, the, the, the numbers of students and the staff and the way that they're grouped um, to try to really make sure that we were meeting all of their needs. And so it, it really did cause, like, oh, well, this group of students, actually, if we bring them with this group of students who might not even be, you know, in the same grade level, but they're the same levels, you know, how do you deliver services different? Um, because, you know, if you just think of them as isolated units, then you end up not having enough staff. But if you start grouping and saying, oh, we've got kids that are very similar, you know, in these three different grades, and we pull them together, it's more effective in terms of delivering services. Um, so that's that's one of the things that, you know, again, to Bob's credit, he spent a lot of time working through that <coughs> scheduling. Um, it was, took some time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's a shift we'll see in eight, in the fall. Yep. 
Yeah, and I think at the end of the, and we'll, like uh, Dr. Megan said, that we'll provide you with the, the analysis of what the um, program evaluation yields. Um, you know, and I, but the, the first glance from, you know, just looking at our programming, I think if we keep the, the, the staff as we kind of have it right now, even with these reductions, we could actually do even more um, for our students. So I think there was almost like, wow, think of the possibilities, think of the co-teaching, um, you know, how you count time with students. Um, we, we might not be doing that efficiently, like, you know, in a co-teaching model that can count for their service delivery. So, you know, it, it's, so we're just rethinking everything when it comes to ESL in a way that I think is going to be very beneficial for the kids. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, Cook again. I keep going. Uh, there we go. All right. That was more school. Uh, again, the, the thing that, that stood out to me when, when you look at this is um, we're, we're looking at an increase in English language learners, and you would think that, well, maybe there's an upward rise, but there's 15% to 13 to 21%. So after really digging into our <coughs> English language learners who take the WIDA access and they get a number and it tells you how much of service they need, we looked at what that service means. Is it all pull out where you have to pull them into a separate classroom? Or can you work with them in the classroom? And we found the most effective way was a combination of the two. So they had some time out, some time in the classroom. You can call that co-teaching or push-in, but it's services delivered while the children are still in the classroom with the general ed students. And that's what I think uh, Kathy talked about earlier is the important part. The more time spent in classroom for all students is better for them. Uh, students with disabilities were kind of happy with this because we saw this going from 21.5% to 17.3, which I think is around the average for the state, as um, a success because of our co-teaching. So when we have two groups in the classroom, two instructors, and you're pulling groups aside and you're having stations and moving from area to area, a student who doesn't have an IEP but is struggling can work with students <coughs> who are getting that extra support. So they don't need to get any kind of additional pullout, additional support, they're getting it in the classroom and they're making progress, so and we, we owe that to kind of, we think that's a, a big success. And we do believe that in time, we were, are going to improve our MCAS scores. I've said before, I think there are three pillars, uh, dedicated and committed parents and students, we had that. We have, need good teachers, we had that. We just didn't have that curriculum aspect, and we're getting that, but I figured there's a fourth pillar too, and that's the community, the town council, the town manager, uh, everyone who's allowing the, the school committee to get money into these programs because everything we're doing this year needed to be funded and we're seeing immediate success if nothing else right now just with the general uh, kind of anecdotal feeling that things are better for the students and for the teachers they really have those professional learning discussions with the coaches and the, um, the tutors and the coordinators Um, and again, those are the projections. And it's interesting to see that there looks like people are leaving each year after grade two. Um, they used to be after kindergarten because some people felt that families stayed here for the full day K and then left for first grade, but we're not seeing that anymore. So I don't know if it's a wave or if it's a bubble or if it's just really happy. People love water. Yeah, people yes. love water tennis. Kimo Carter says, happy kids learn and happy towns teach. <laughs> so, um, our accomplishments, we have uh, expanded inclusive practices. And to Kendra's point, there, there is a, you, you create a co-taught class for the need. You don't create it and wait for them to come. So we found that we were getting a lot of students in um, that were ESL students. So what does that mean? And I kind of dug into it quite a bit this year. And ESL, is a lot of it is just really good literacy instruction, sometimes delivered in the classroom, sometimes out. So we moved one of our ELL teachers to kindergarten and had her co-teach. So we have a co-top model in kindergarten, and we have some uh, additional push-in or co-taught uh, incidents in other grade levels as well. But we thought if we got it to K-1-2, it would be uh, very effective. Um, three, four, five were the co-taught classes that we had focused on and we're going down to grade two um, because there's a need. We have a lot of students in grade two that have a need for a shared aid, an additional adult in the classroom, and they have IEPs. So we thought that would be a good focus for us and we have very eager teachers to get the training and to do that. One other area we had is 
a lot of students that are on IEPs were finding had a need for a specialized reading program. What that means is very trans, well, very confusing. What is a specialized reading program? So it's really a reading program delivered by a special educator. So having them at the grade level and in the classroom is the most effective way to do that. Um, so can you just tell, well, what is a specialized reading program? I mean, there are different things. Uh, Wilson is a reading okay. program that's specialized. The foundations is for earlier, K-2, to okay. and Wilson in 3-5. to five. So you're really uh, focusing on different aspects of teaching of reading. Okay. Um, what you can't do is lock it down and say, let's try to use Wilson, because that's not an answer for everything. So we want someone who can differentiate very well. Um, we have great relationships with some of our community members. The Brigham House especially are our close neighbors, kind of like a condo association. <laughs> and, uh, they visit us, we visit them, and um, the kids and the adults get a lot out of that. So we're really happy with that. Our veterans group comes every Memorial Day. We have them in for Veterans Day as well. And um, we have written cards and letters to them when they go to the hospital because unfortunately that's an aging population for the most part. Uh, police and fire have been so helpful. They come into the schools. They're doing uh, instruction on safety with strangers, internet safety, and uh, the fire department's in doing a series with the third grade on um, how to be safe at home and how to have escape routes and things like that. Um, Watertown Public Library, and again, thanks to our great site council at the Hosmer School, they've connected with Watertown Public Library and started some after-school programs, and um, <coughs> one of them is a reading a book club and the librarian from the public library comes to the school, or will be coming to the school once our books are out, uh, and be running some book programs. And there's also a uh, engineering course that will be starting up in the spring. Again, all parent, site council, PTO driven, which is great. Um, the lab classrooms are consistent throughout the district. We're really happy with that. Um, we're going to expand that next year and add different grade levels. Um, and this went to uh, <coughs> to slide before we finish, but we hired three Title I literacy tutors, and that's uh, someone that's working less than 15 hours a week that works with children in specialized reading programs. But we've also hired a math tutor, and she started too, so she's picking up some of the, uh, the support for the teachers in math. So those are other examples of co-teaching and support. Um, and again, that's the phonics and foundations we talked about. Can I ask a question yep. on that side? Um, the grade level, the, the two-way communication systems, mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit more about those? Sure. So uh, one of the district goals was two-way communication. Rather than just getting a newsletter home every so often or a nice website, how does the parents respond back? And so an example would be grade four has something called Seesaw, which I know some of you are familiar with. Uh, things are uh, videotaped uh, without the children in it. So literally, you look at the screen, and you'll see someone doing a math problem. And you just see the figures being written in a voiceover of a child telling, telling you what's happening. So a uh, password is given to the parents, and the teacher puts that on, and the parents have the opportunity to look at that and then comment on their child's work. Great job with your math problem today. So we have people in different grade levels are doing something different and sharing it at our staff meetings. So by the end of the year, we'll have one consistent thing for each grade level. So everyone at least is sending something home that's good across the board. So it's going to be by grade level, or is it going to be school-wide? It depends. We're going to look at it at the end of the year as a, as a school, and the staff are going to kind of take a look at them. We've seen some good models. They've shown Seesaw, um, and there's a couple of other things that teachers are working on. So if everyone, if there's a K2 model, that's great. If there's a 3-5 or all the way through, we're not sure yet. How do you problem. deal with the um, parents who's in, who, where English is enough? their first language in this two-way communication? Good point. So we have some increased um, need for um, translation, and we're working with that. We're trying to get something so it's a little bit more instantaneous, but we're, right now we have to wait for it to be translated. There's always Google Translate and things like that, but it's always just a little bit hot. Yes. Yeah. And that, so that's done on like a case of family-by-family family basis with the teachers, or, or that we'll be doing? We're trying to do it on actually a language by language basis because the more need for different languages is what we have to focus on. Great. And one of the things that uh, we're working with is um, parent liaisons. Um, so we had a, a pilot program at the middle school for um, parent liaisons with the, the three most commonly spoken languages. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we wouldn't be able to do it for the 37 languages that are spoken, but certainly when you have a, a critical mass, um, having somebody who could kind of be the conduit of information, they're not necessarily even, I mean, they're not the translator, but they're the person who kind of has the cultural aspects that bring families into the building. So we're working on, actually with one in an earlier budget line, um, to try to expand that, um, to provide a little bit of that in the elementary schools as well. That's um, great, because at the last PTO meeting at Hosmer, um, there's a teacher who came and um, presented an idea about um, having like a committee of people to welcome mm -hmm. new families or families um, in, you know, where English was their first language. I think it, it will contribute to, hopefully it would contribute in the long run to more parents <coughs> being involved, because you end up seeing the same mm -hmm. parents yes. at the meetings and stuff, so more parents. <laughs> yeah. yeah representing the students, yeah. Um, improve our service delivery of math, and I think these things are already happening, and we've got our math coach is just so high energy and a very personable person who is very, if you've ever been a teacher and a math coach comes in or a literacy coach, there's always a little bit of a, what do you know that I don't know? So she approaches so, uh, um, inoffensively that she's really working well with the staff, I think across the district, but definitely for us. So she's doing a great job. And thanks to um, Elizabeth for putting all that together. And the math assessments are so important for us because we can't use anything else to drive instruction unless we know where they are. So that's really helpful. Our maker space is turning very interesting up in the um, library. Uh, Roger Dubuque is the librarian and he's done a lot of training on maker space. We have 3D printers, vinyl cutters, paper carts that teachers can check out, and he will have completed um, one project for classroom by the end of the year. And I think the PTO will also be using it for after school projects as well. Uh, goals that are supported, uh, literacy, math, extracurricular, I think I talked a little bit about that. Um, and uh, Lily's gone, but one of her questions was, how do you know if this is working? And what we're doing is we're following a cohort of second grade students this year who were in first grade last year who took foundations. They get foundations this year. So we're tracking them and comparing them to student assessments that, that didn't take the foundations and seeing um, just sort of for us what the, what the improvement is. Um, the social emotional well-being of the students. When we get our SEL program together, I've had the opportunity to work with both of them. And they're both great programs, as Dr. McGinnis said, and whichever one the district goes with, you can't go wrong. So that'll be a very positive thing. Um, those are just repetitive. And uh, what we're hoping for is the, uh, we asked for the grade two teacher, and again, the classroom libraries that you heard about earlier was for Rita's workshop. You need a lot of books that are leveled at different levels. And uh, the more money for books, the better. Can't go wrong with books. And uh, by being more efficient with our assignment of students and assignment of caseloads, we were able to reduce by 0.5 special educator, the same with ESL. It doesn't mean we're getting fewer students or the lead need is less, but um, the way we're able to support in the classroom, we think we'll be able to help fund other things. And that's the second, second grade teacher that we talked about earlier. Yeah, just to mention, um, part of the reason why you see a significant reduction in the salary is because the um, preschool staff, which was, yes, the preschool is located at the Hosmer preschool, at the Hosmer building, as, as well as the Phillips School, uh, the staff had all been coded in our account structure to the Hosmer School uh, as their location, and so we created within our charter accounts a new location specifically for the preschool and have reallocated those salaries from the Hosmer to the preschool so that we're separately tracking that as if it were its own building, as it essentially almost is its own program within a building. Just saying, Kendra, that it's 
this is my first time going through seeing all of these details, but it's hard to imagine trying to understand it with all of it piled together like it was before. So I just really appreciate you pulling all of this out because it seems so clear to me being the first time I've really run through this amount of detail and I can't imagine trying to figure it out before. So thank you for that work. Yeah, it's helpful. Sorry, can I just ask one more quick yeah. question? Just because I noticed that for the role and the kind of presentations, it had the continuation of the um, FLESS program to grade two, but Bob, so, yours yeah, didn't mention it, but that doesn't mean that it's not continuing, correct? No, it doesn't. I just, I'm not fond of that. I'm sorry. Getting out there. Yeah, okay, great. Just, what I mean, yeah. 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 Well, there are actually a number of things that were district yeah. Relate, yeah. Related on yeah, the bowl and kind of slide or the, on the kind of slides that yeah. weren't included there, and they are all part of yeah. the I just I, I was sure almost sure, but then I was like, just have to make sure because that's another one of the the amazing things about Watertown that I feel so positive about and lucky that my daughters had the opportunity for. So I'm thankful yeah. for everyone who's supported <coughs> that program over the last few years and made it happen, yeah. budget wise, yeah. teaching wise. So good evening, I'm Stacey Gillen, the principal of the Lowell. So I'll go over um, the demographic overview. Um, I think that Lowell in general, other than the third grade, um, where we have a significant higher class um, <coughs> size, for third grade we've, it, we're experiencing a nice healthy class size. We're benefiting um, across the board. We, you know, we're averaging around 18, 19, so that's really nice. Um, our economically disadvantaged, our English language learners and our students with disabilities um, is pretty steady. Um, you know, there's not a huge change over time. I think it goes just with the, the actual population of the building at that moment. Um, I think this year we're slightly increased on our students with disabilities for 2018. I think it's a little bit up, but again, it's, it's keeping with the trend that we already um, have established. Our um, MCAS scores, um, you can see there at the bottom, I think that um, there is a lot of hope that we're going to see some significant changes in those scores this year. Um, I think especially in the area of mathematics, I've seen dramatic differences um, in the classroom and the teachers um, really focusing deeply on um, areas of weakness and really diving in and collecting a lot of data and then um, changing instruction and creating instructional groupings um, inside the school. So I think I'm looking forward to seeing um, how that turns out next year. Our projections over time, they're very steady. Um, so again, it, it makes sense to reduce the, the second grade classroom this year in the um, for the upcoming school year. In fact, um, we've, oops, sorry. Um, whoops. One of the things that I can say is we actually lost three more um, second graders just this week. So I really think that that was a very good um, idea. I, I think that we're gonna be in a very healthy classroom size for next year. We're looking at about 20 to 21, I think, by the year's end. So that's, I don't think that should be a worry um, moving forward. So our accomplishments, I think the accomplishments this year are very much shared across the district. Um, literacy, we um, began our implementation of the Balanced Literacy Program, focusing in our core instruction. We partnered with TLA like the other two schools. Um, we've expanded our foundations, um, phonics curriculum. We hired a district coach and we hired um, three building-based Title I tutors that are supporting our reading and our, our reading specialists. Um, to really make sure that we're covering the building and getting um, some really good intervention. Our math curriculum, uh, curriculum the alignment to the standards K through five, um, that work has been, I think, deep, intense, and um, very, it built the capacity this year of our teachers, um, I, I think across the school, but I think the leadership aspect of it with our math leaders was incredible. I think it really helped to um, highlight some areas of um, that were not being covered um, through their deep work, and then it's really addressed um, areas where we needed to go deeper. The math coach, um, again, I, I think uh, to echo all the things that I don't want to be redundant, and I know people are kind of like, it's getting late, but I really have to say um, the coaching and um, the work that Elizabeth's been doing has been um, 
incredible this year and it's been taken with such um, enthusiasm by our teachers and I think that is really the hardest thing is to convince teachers when they're going through any type of change or um, having more staff in their classrooms to make them feel that um, it is really benefiting it's for their benefit and not um, something that's coming in and being um, kind of um, as an op from an observation or a, um, a level of um, evaluation so I think it's been wonderful hired a title one tutor also in um, math we've been um, you know consistently having monthly professional development geared towards all of the pedagogical changes that were going on and we acquired the 10 marks online program which again I think that's really getting our kids ready for the types of strategies the types of um, skills that they need to use on the computer um, that will benefit them in going to a standard based MCAS uh, going to the MCAS on the computer a lot of the things that um, we need to get them ready for is not just the new test that they've put in place, but also how to approach taking the test on a computer. And 10 Marks is really helping them with those tools. So, um, and we also have Type to Learn and that we've spent a lot of time to really get the kids on the computer so when they get there on the day of the assessments, they're feeling very comfortable. Uh, Co-teaching, uh, am I not pressing in time? Okay. So other accomplishments, co-teaching I think um, would be up there with a huge accomplishment this year. We have a co-taught model um, classroom in K through five, and then we also have um, more than one in two through five. So we have um, one in kindergarten, um, two, one in first grade, one, um, two in second grade, two in third, two in fourth, and two in fifth. So, um, and in the other classrooms where they're not co-taught with a special educator, they're taught with, uh, taught with an ESL teacher. So I really think that the, the whole building is in a co-taught classroom mode, and we have our students spending the majority of their day inside the classroom, which was a substantial change from last year's practice and previous years to that. And we're seeing that um, in the early information that we're receiving through our assessments, that that is um, having a significant impact on our students, especially our students with disabilities. We are enjoying um, switching over to the next generation science standards. And again, Elizabeth's help in that has been amazing. She comes in, she's always running around with uh, you know cookie sheets and beans <laughs> and all sorts of things. Um, because if she knows the lesson's going off, she wants to make sure the tools are in their hands. Um, and the teachers, when the tools are in their hands and the lesson plans have been planned, it, it's all that more um, probable that those lessons are going to occur in the classroom. So you need to have all those things happening behind the scenes. The ISP program, which is the integrated support program that Kathy talked about that started at the Lowell, it's a continuation on from what was already happening in the middle school and the high school, but those kids um, we're being identified in our district and some of those kids were staying in our district others were leaving our district I think now with the approach that we have we're able to really focus um, it really getting the those needs for those students um, it's a very specialized program what we do in that room is um, very different from what we do in other rooms in our building however um, the academic um, rigor is not being diminished inside that classroom. The academics that are being delivered are the same academics that are being delivered in all of the, um, the gen ed setting. And those students are taking those same assessments and working with the same um, curriculum as <coughs> our gen ed setting. So um, right now I'm pretty proud of that program. It's kind of and I'm, I think we're looking to possibly split the program to be more of a primary grade with a little bit of an upper elementary grade for next year if, if it warrants um, the enrollment. FLESS, again, that's been just a wonderful program. Ms. McCready does a phenomenal job. She walks through and stays in character all day, so she does not come out of her um, Spanish speaking mode, which is wonderful. Um, so th those are our accomplishments. There are many more, but again, there's just so much going on right now, and you've already heard so many other good things. So, um, Some of the things that we are looking to this budget to support for the upcoming year, the Broaden the Balanced Literacy Program, really to expand. Oops, sorry. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not good like this. This is the one thing. Do I need another one? Um, 
to, exp um, to expand and broaden our um, already growing Vance literacy program and really getting um, the coaching from TLA to go um, into new areas of the building along with um, helping kind of foster some leadership within the teachers that re were exposed to that um, training this year. Continue, so we're going to continue with TLA. We're going to expand the Foundation's Phonics. We're going to expand um, you know, the class and libraries with a focus on um, nonfiction because um, you know, that is an area of weakness in our libraries currently. Math, we want to further the curriculum <coughs> alignment. Um, we want to continue the class coaching and tar target professional development, 10 marks, um, implementation of the common assessments across the district, and then iReady would also kind of come into this where we'll be using that data to um, drive instruction. And then science, uh, making sure that we've implemented the units that were prepared this year and further kind of develop and strengthen those units into next year. Um, again, co-teaching, we are, like I said, we have five full classrooms that are co-taught with a special educator all day. We, were gonna, we are expanding that to seven classrooms for next year. And um, then the, uh, there'll be other co-taught classrooms, not with special educators, but with ESL teachers. We're going to be implementing the universal assessment tool, which I think is really going to help us focus in on what is working well in our core instruction and where do we still further have to go to strengthen. And then um, ISP, again, possibly there's, um, we'll be expanding the program, but if we're not expanding the program, we'll just continue to further develop the program and the roles of that program. Plus, we'll grow into grade two, tier two instruction. I think this is a real area that I want to focus specifically on next year. I um, is really trying to, after we're able to get some information about our core instruction and how effective it is, but actually try to grow and um, strengthen our tier instruct tier two instruction. Talk about who's delivering it, what the materials are for that um, instruction, and um, really try to come up with um, a systematic approach to how children kind of are tiered inside the building and how they move through those tiers in um, as well. And then we're also with my school council and with the um, with the Lowell Volunteer Committee. There, the Lowell School has a community volunteers. It's a very robust program of volunteers that work to support the teachers, and we're looking to collect data on how that somehow has a direct improve, um, effect on actual the parent engagement of our um, community volunteers. How is that? strengthening um, the work that happens in our classroom and um, what effect does it have on the learners. So they're actually collecting their own data, but we're trying to use that and try to also further um, expand their roles. They're working very much in our libraries, in our community gardens. They do a ton of work behind the scenes for each of the teachers. So we want to just kind of keep that going and strengthen our community. Can I ask a question? Yep. That? Um, that's a great program, and I love mm -hmm. the model. I've talked to your um, parents in your school about the, that organized it, and I wonder how we can replicate that, kind of ingrain it into the culture of the other schools, because it's very much part of the culture of your school. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's so beneficial. So I just wonder, like, how can we take take a look at that program and and replicate it in the other elementary schools so that it's it's kind of part of what happens and part of the school culture. I, I do think it lives um, with um, the desire of a leader in that, um, and they, they have always benefited from a very strong leader in the, prior to Julie Cand Candiello, who's there now, who's very strong. I also think I've heard that the previous um, leaders have been really fabulous. It's really not taking no for an answer, putting people on the spot and utilizing everybody in any way that they can inside the classroom, outside the classroom, before school, after school. Um, now they even have um, greeters at the doors helping the kids out of the cars. I mean, they just, they just, they are always looking for areas, but I do think that it's not so much uh, me going after them, they're really coming after me. So it's trying to find the right person who really wants that role and then getting them and setting them off into your community. Um, but I'm sure she would talk more about it. Yeah, no, I'm, in, I'm in, interested in ways that we can, that parents can be more supportive mm -hmm. in, you know, whether it's, Greeting, you know, greeting or helping at lunch or you know, doing things that are inside the school that are, are beneficial for the school and mm -hmm. for the culture. And um, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm, it's it's a great model. Yeah. 
All right, so I'll get to um, our wants um, and then some of the things that we're, we took a critical eye to. So, um, you know, after having been in both a school the size of the Cunniffin, been in a school the size of the Hosmer, I found myself in a school the size of Lowell. And this year, it has been a challenge with the amount of administrative duties to be able to act, act as the, the leader, act, educational leader um, in one regard, and also kind of keep all those little things that have to get done behind the scenes all done. Um, a lot of the responsibilities have been shared um, between the administrator and um, the guidance department, and so sometimes they're working on too much administration of, of things such as MCAS or um, other details, um, helping out in the GET process. They're, they're leading that charge right now where I think that um, it might be more suited to have somebody outside of um, that role um, kind of leading the GET process. And um, so that's why the um, assistant principal has been put in there. Um, I think that it really warrants it being the size of the school in, the, in this current age of um, what really the demands are for getting work done. Well, so it's proposing <laughs> to increase the size of the school right. soon. Yes. So. Um, so again, classroom libraries to expand the libraries. I think that it's probably something we're going to be working on year after year over time. We're looking for every way to get more materials into the classroom because as we have all of our students staying in the classroom, so do the needs expand and the amount of reading materials that are effective for each of those reading levels so that we're, we're reaching broader or we have a larger continuum of readers inside the room. Um, and I think that also needs to support our ESL population. So again, there's always a need for more um, text. Um, the regular education classroom, you know, teacher, that is a reduction um, that would be coming up and it appears that it is, it's not going to negatively affect us um, in this next coming school year. And then um, this, the, the, the half guidance, um, I think, it really kind of like being able to take over the, the, all of those administrative roles, like the MCAS, the GET process, watching and supporting the data and the data grids, which a lot of that work now is going really being put on the teachers to take over those roles instead of having it run by guidance. These are all things that are going to come off the plates of the guidance department, which will give them focus area to actually serve the students in the needs and in the ways that they were intended to serve. And then the assistant principal should be working on more of those administrative aspects and then also supporting the students because that having another body that is not assigned to a classroom who is really there to support the children's learning can, can actually go to the classroom and do some, you know, in, in the classroom support, do some kind of um, just chatting with the kids and get them back on track. So I, I do think that we're not going to experience a loss in that area as far as from a student support perspective. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, is there consistency, we have uh, Hosmer and then the little next year we'll have an assistant principal. Is there consistency about what the, that job description is and what that role is throughout the district? Or is this, is that it? It's mm -hmm. the same thing? There's okay. Yeah. No, I know, yeah. I'm just, I'm wondering, oh, like, are, are the roles, sim are, are you envisioning the role of your assistant principal being similar to what it is? I don't know, and I just wonder if it. I, I mean, I don't know exactly what responsibility um, Mrs. Patrick has taken on, but again, she's been there for a while, so yeah. some of those responsibilities she's been able to um, acquire over time are probably a little bit more expansive than who I what I see actually happening right away next mm -hmm. year if the person isn't from our community. Um, and I also think that because the size of the school and the guidance and some of the other factors are a little bit still out of balance, I don't know that the role is going to be able to be completely equal, but um, my intent is to um, sit down with Bob and Mary Kate and kind of um, kind of find out what does she do and then how can we take some of the things that we want to take away from our guidance and that's really going to be the crux of where we focus um, our energies at trying to create the, the role in Lowell's need. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I think I didn't no. have um, any unfunded um, Budget. I can go back if everyone needs that overview. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Oh, am I going over to the yeah, else? Yeah,
An early step? All right, then. An early step. So, just when you thought you were done. <laughs> <laughs> this will be super quick um, because a lot of it is very repetitive to what I presented during um, Kathy's time frame. But here's just an outline of the enrollment of early steps. And sometimes the number of um, fluctuates a little bit more so because of the students turning three that are referred through either early intervention or that do come to us. That changes drastically um, from year to year. And also, sometimes we have a mass exodus of kids going up to kindergarten, which then opens up a lot more space either for our community children or for our special ed children, who then um, we do take some time to fill some of those um, spots throughout the year. Preschool is one of those programs that does have a continuous rolling enrollment. And so from one day to the next, you never know how many students you're going to have showing up, um, which is also very exciting for all of us, too. <laughs> Before you go on to the next slide, sure. the, the auditor in me, um, there's a typo, the total 93 is really 108. <coughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it did look very odd. Um, it, you know, it um, might not be edited because it's substantially separate and folded. There might be overlap there. Okay. Well, um, no, I was assuming one twelve, one seventeen. They're different. Okay. Oh, that's oh. Tina's. Tina's. Ah, okay. Yep. No, you're right. Good catch. Made it worth the three hours. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> that was pretty impressive. <laughs> so um, the accomplishments again are just to re reiterate what we said earlier today. The get process for students um, that are in the general ed setting for us. Um, the implementation of the tiered systems of support, and then also the professional development of um, the. IAs as well, as well as the teachers, so continuing all of that. <coughs> and so for the recommended budget, as we mentioned earlier, would be to add on the PM session of our half-day class at this particular time for the teacher and for the uh, two IAs that are currently assigned for that, um, for that classroom, and really to be able to increase the opportunities for families who have express an interest in the full day program or who are waitlisted for the pre-kindergarten program to have an um, alternative setting for them to go to. It wouldn't be the same amount of time as the pre-kindergarten at this particular time, um, but it would be a longer day than just the 1120 or um, the 1150 to 220 um, time frame. So again, looking at what we've already discussed for some of our recommended budgets. Um, so the point two for the admin assistant, the preschool teacher, point five, the, um, the 1.0, which is really <coughs> adding on to the two additional assistants that we have. Um, the reduction, looking at the administrative assistant, there is currently what is considered the family outreach coordinator um, at the preschool. So looking at that reduction of the 0.5, the ESL teacher, and then the resume, uh, revenue offset as well. So that's what we would be looking at. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so preschool and pre-K, if you combine them, is that, is that budget neutral? And is that self-sustaining? Self Pre-kindergarten is, uh, I haven't run that analysis for this year, but pre-kindergarten is essentially self -sustaining. So we charge off the salary of the pre-K teacher and the IA in that pre-K program to completely 100% to the revolving fund. Preschool is different because there are some general ed, some typical peers, as well as special ed. So the um, budget, school budget, absorbs the expenditure related to special ed, but we can uh, charge Offsets. off with, for that portion okay. of the expense that's for the general ed. Okay, so we don't know, is that, is that close to self-sustaining or at I think it's pretty close, yes. Okay. I think we said we were going to look at that <laughs> next year at like fee time and For try fees. to think about a regular right. increase in that tuition. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Just you be, sorry. Before Tom says anything, is the addition there, is it, shouldn't it be different? Oh. Shouldn't it be 0.7? Isn't, aren't you subtracting? At which point? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
There's the no FTEs. FTEs. Yep. There's okay. the FTE yeah. at the bottom. Oh, there yeah, well, you moved. We just missed the point. It should be basically point seven. Point seven. Right. Net point seventy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Things are going so smooth. Everyone's going perfectly well. Then you had to jump on in. The FTE's up. I think they're the dollar amount. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and just one point about the ES again, that ESL reduction is not, it, it might end up being overall looking at the district level. Um, one thing that we do know with ESL at preschool, actually it's not, it's not a requirement, but we do it, which is great. Um, so what we're thinking of is uh, having that support maybe being Hosmer and preschool, so having the teacher you know, picking up some of the Hosmer as well as the preschool and not just having the one dedicated. So it's not like we're cutting out all ES, because there, there is only just a point five, but we're not cutting out all ESL from preschool. We're just simply saying that we think that there might be resources at the Hosmer that could do the preschool work. So. I think that all of preschool is language development. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Great. So those um, salary lines from the, <laughs> those <laughs> salary lines from the Hosmer that you saw with all those big yeah. deficits, those are all moved over here. So particularly you see those high, you know, four hundred thousand, two hundred thousand changes in this because there was there was nothing there in the prior years. Oh, well, secondary. Secondary. Okay. So there you That's, go. We'll be here talking about All right. Um, great. Thank you all very, very much. We really appreciate it. It was very informative. Um, we'll move on to uh, the budget, future budget independence committee meet, subcommittee meetings. We have one tomorrow night at 6 30, um, pending snow. The forecast has gotten better. It's gotten mm -hmm. better. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we'll assume we're here tomorrow night at 6 30 p.m. Um, and yeah. it will be oh, secondary oh, school's oh, budget at that point. And, and, and busing. And the busing, yeah. 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 Um, motion to adjourn. No, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Aye.